Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our special planning committee meeting on March 22nd. Beautiful day here again in Port Carling. Um, so we are um, calling this meeting to order at uh, nine o'clock. I um, acknowledge that there is a supplementary agenda today. Uh, Ralph Coham and Bob Clark will be providing comment today. And Jason Sift, who was on the supplementary agenda, is going to be moved over to Ali Brown's designate for our Muskoka. So I believe that covers that. And I'm going to, this meeting is being held electronically from the council chambers. Uh, and I, the, the um, agenda was published with, um, I'm going to just go back and read this. This must be Tuesday morning. Sorry, guys. Okay. Part of the um, members of the public may observe the proceedings as success in the live broadcast. Um, and if you are part of this meeting, you are consenting to having your, uh, your face and views broadcast on this. I am acknowledging that we have all of our senior management here. We have full... We have full quorum, which is great. And I, I welcome our guests, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond to our meeting today, which is about our OP review. We are going to get our public feedback this morning and, um, and in preparation of the new draft, which will be then sent out for a public meeting. So with all of that, I'm going to, um, ask for a disclosure of pecuniary interest. Anybody here have any of that? No. Okay, okay, thank you. So we will begin then with our invited delegations. And uh, the first up, I believe, is um, Deborah Martin Downs from the Muskoka Lakes Association. Oh, she's not there? Okay. Um, who who have we got in then, Elizabeth? Have we got Ken Pierce? Okay, let's bring Ken in. And I see we have Frank Potto and we have Susan Emlett. So we'll do Ken, Susan, and then Frank. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Pierce. How are you? Good. Uh, I saw Nick McDonald was going to delegate. Was he going to go first with his uh, comments? I, I, was, I saw that on the agenda. Uh, what well, he's invited. Um, we, we were going to go through this section by section, Mr. Pierce. So we're going to have Mr. McDonald on, um, on the highlights of the report speak to us on each section and then we'll discuss it. So I think it makes more sense to have our delegates comment first, as in not Nick, or not Nick, but um, our public, and then we will have a discussion afterwards. Okay, well, no, that's fine. I just wanted, didn't wanna jump in ahead of him if uh, he was slated first. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Bridgman, uh, Ken Pierce, 2232 Muskoka Road 169. Uh, I'm going to speak to the uh, resort policies in the draft official plan that's under part F. Uh, I would note that uh, Meridian in their March 15 memorandum had some very good recommendations on what they were proposing for the resort policies, uh, which included a detailed set of restrictions on occupancy. That's number nine of their recommendations supporting single owner accommodation uses and discouraging development of plans of condominium. Uh, that was number 10. And the uh, last one was requiring a variety of substantive resort related amenities and services and that in-person management each be available on site. And that was number 11. Uh, we're very much uh, supportive of those. Uh, next, uh, wanted to talk about uh, rezoning of land to non-resort uses such as marinas being converted and uh, rezoned for resort commercial. Uh, we think that that should only be done at the time of a comprehensive review. Uh, we note that there's already a large pool of uh, unused or underutilized resort properties in, in the township. 
uh, and that marinas constitute an extremely valuable resource as we're going to hear more about in the water access lot section. Um, the next thing that I would comment on is we recommend adding density restrictions. Uh, we went through this in quite a lot of detail for the Minette OPA. Uh, this would be lake frontage and acreage, uh, similar to those in Seguin Township. We're suggesting uh, a maximum of one unit per six meters or 20 feet of water frontage and 10 units per hectare. Uh, that's uh, like in the Minette OPA, we don't think that should be deferred to the uh, zoning bylaw, the implementing zoning bylaw. We recommend that the following policies be carried forward from the current OP, uh, lots and siting requirements requiring open space, minimum frontage and acreage. Uh, right now, the current OP talks about a minimum of, of two hectares for a resort and minimum water frontage of 150 meters uh, and limiting resorts to the mainland, so not on islands. And we think those should be carried forward. Those are, are very important. They were agreed upon by the working group. Uh, unfortunately, they're not in the current draft. Uh, limiting the height to, to what it is in the township, 14 meters in natural tree line. Carry forward policies in the current OP uh, regarding resorts when they cease to carry on business. Uh, we think that's very important. They shouldn't just morph into residential uses. Uh, and this is consistent with the part about uh, permitting the downsizing of resorts, which we are in favor of, uh, obviously not at commercial densities, uh, but uh, downsizing uh, to something uh, more appropriate. Uh, we would propose that the uh, use restrictions from the Minette OPA also be carried forward. Uh, I think the key takeaways for me are uh, that all of the hard work developing the Minette OPA and some of the critical provisions from the current OP uh, should be carried forward into this OP. Uh, that seems to be the directions of Meridian and form the basis of our comments. Uh, we have provided section references in our table uh, and we've also provided a red line markup with our detailed comments to section F, uh, the uh, resort to commercial policies. Uh, just on uh, water access lots, I would also invite you to consider uh, Mr. Chris Morgan's comments. Uh, he has some very useful ones. Uh, he wasn't able to delegate. He didn't, I think, get in under the wire, but I think he had some uh, very helpful comments about uh, marina uh, long-term leases for boat slip rentals and parking spots. Uh, and as uh, Mr. McDonald in his report said, uh, if a marina ceases to carry on business, uh, something needs to be done for the water access lots to make sure that they have access going forward. So I, I full, uh, wholeheartedly adopt those comments and would invite uh, council and staff to look at those as well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Pierce. And uh, Mr. Morgan, uh, yes, I have that in my notes too, under that section too. So thank you for that. Um, I, I believe we're going to go to Ms. Epplett next. Is, is Deb here yet, Deborah? Yes, she is. Oh, she is? Well, maybe we could go to Deborah then. Well, you can bring, you could bring, you can bring them both in, yeah. This is so nice having Elizabeth back in the room again, I have to tell you, <laughs> with the restrictions being uh, lifted. Okay, uh, Deb, I can see you. And uh, Susan, Ms. Epplett, I'm gonna let um, Ms. Martin Downs go first. I know that was, uh, that was your preference and she's here now. So Deb, can you can you hear me? You're just on mute. Okay, it looks like your microphone's on. Um, Air Bridge, or Chair Bridgman, if you can hear me, I cannot hear you. So <laughs> I'm oh. not a challenge this morning, apparently many challenges. 
Um, yes, please go oh, ahead. I can just depute and uh, if you can hear me, then uh, uh, hopefully uh, I'll be able to get back onto hearing you or be able to hear you when, uh, if there's any questions, so. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Bridgman, members of council, uh, for the opportunity to speak this morning. Apparently, I haven't been doing enough uh, uh, deputations and uh, digital meetings since I retired, but uh, uh, I'm Deborah Martin Downs, and I'm the president of the Muskoka Lakes Association. Uh, with my colleagues, Ken Pierce and Susan Epplett, we plan to provide some key comments we've made on the October 2021 draft of the official plan uh, in association with the Friends of Muskoka. The MLA represents 2,000 plus members or approximately 11,500 individuals, and most of those, 80% of which are, are located in the township of Muskoka Lakes. I want to thank you for making the environment the star of the plan. So it seemed appropriate that uh, we start our deputation with environment first. We note that none of the draft environmental policies have been challenged by anyone that have submitted comments. The support for the water of our lakes and the natural form of our shoreline has never been greater. Yet there are policies in the document that are being challenged which have the potential to impact the environment and therefore council is encouraged to apply an environment first or precautionary principle lens to all the policies in order to ensure that we don't chip away at the intent of this policy document. Our lakes and shorelines and wildlands are finite and shared resources. And I'm reminded of the concept of the tragedy of the commons. No one and everyone owns it. If you're not familiar with the concept, the tragedy of the commons states that individuals acting independently and rationally according to each's self-interest behave contrary to the best interests of the whole group by depleting some common resource. The air and water around us cannot be readily fenced or owned, so impacts to the commons must be prevented by different means. That includes coercive laws and policies. Every new enclosure of the commons involves some infringement of someone's personal liberty, but it's done for the greater good. So I asked the committee to remember the linkage between land use and our lakes. It's not enough to have environmental policies if the land use policies don't reflect them or support them. We're very pleased to see the policy intent to develop a natural heritage system. And when we're surrounded by trees, it's hard to see the forest sometimes. Having a natural heritage system is important to ensuring we protect large connected tracts of forest, which will connect habitat types, migration paths, and the shoreline to the upland. A natural heritage system prevents the death of the forest by a thousand cuts, and with it, the biodiversity contained therein. The plan provides some forward-thinking policies around sustainability, green development, and climate change. And while we appreciate that the uh, township may not have all the tools at its disposal right now, the time to act is now. The language needs to be much more committal for effective implementation, to not consider but to not consider but complete, to not encourage but require. Further, the plan needs to consolidate the sustainability directions. Green development standards are really no different than sustainable development, and climate change policies all mixed into sustainable development as well. So to make it easier to find and apply, we've suggested that all should be combined into one category let's call it sustainable development, within which you have green development standards and climate change, and even some of your environmental policies. And if these new ways of designing and building are to be enabled, they need to be reflected in other policy sections. So servicing should reference water conservation measures introduced under the sustainable development banner. Given the importance of runoff to lake water quality, we're pleased to see the incorporation of low impact development, a type of green infrastructure, and more natural way, a more natural way of managing runoff. However, we note that the stormwater management policies are missing some critical pieces, like the basic requirements for pre and post quantity control and would benefit from some technical review by a stormwater engineer. The devil is in the details and we've provided a number of suggestions for wording improvements and consistency between sections. And as always, we'd be happy to work with the consultants to clarify any of our submission. Uh, those are my remarks for today, Chair Bridgman. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Martin Downs. If you still can't hear me, that's that's good. <laughs> so, okay, thank you. All right, Ms. Heplet. And and uh, Ms. Martin Downs, can I just get you to turn your microphone off? Oh, you can't hear me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> so there she goes. Okay, welcome, Ms. Heplet. Thank you, Chair Bridgman. Good morning, everyone. 
This committee and our community have dug deep into these official plan policies since the review began over two and a half years ago. You've received the community's input throughout the review, envisioning sessions, public workshops, public meetings, multiple surveys, and extensive delegations and written submissions. And consistently, the vast majority of your constituents have indicated the importance of protecting what makes Muskoka so special. Our natural environment and treed shorelines, our clean water, and the ever important view from the canoe that seems to be under threat. We also ask you to keep in mind that many of the policies in the draft OP that provide these protections result from recommendations of the working group. The MLA and Friends of Muskoka have heard from our members and supporters throughout this review. This official plan is a priority for our thousands of members and supporters and their families. In our March 4th letter, we provided our detailed comments to you that were developed with input from a professional planner and environmental specialist we hired to advise us. Today, I'd like to explain our views on nine of the key policies. Regarding aggregates, we support comments made by Mr. Steve Rohacek on behalf of the Muskoka Small Lakes Coalition in his letter yesterday about the importance of maintaining a two kilometer setback from the waterfront zone and extending it to all aggregate operations and maintaining the current official plans requirement to locate new aggregate operations within close proximity to provincial highway. We agree there's no need to reference the provincial policy statements. The township is allowed to have more restrictive requirements than the PPS. And this is an example of where our community believes the policies should be more restrictive in order to protect our lakes. The fact that someone may appeal is not a reason to back off policies that the community supports and the working group recommended. Regarding the site plan approval policies, we support the draft site plan approval policies to help ensure sustainable development and provide an enforcement tool for the township. We'd like to reinforce that the district official plan requires site plan control on waterfront lots. We also recommend adding lighting, landscaping, and stormwater management as factors to consider for shoreline development. The policies should also better protect our dark skies by requiring that exterior lights minimize glare and light clutter and not cause light trespass. For recreational carrying capacity, we believe that RCC can be a useful tool. Since 77% of survey respondents supported RCC as a limiting factor, we encourage the township to reach out to smaller lake associations for feedback on retaining RCC as a hard cap in the OP. We also support RCC being included in lake plans and note it has been upheld by the Ontario Municipal Board for Seguin Township's official plan. Regarding small remote lakes, please consider reinstating the current official plan policy discouraging and limiting development on small remote lakes. These policies were in a previous draft but have been omitted. Regarding rural lot creation, the draft official plan permits the creation of an unlimited number of additional rural lots. We believe the policies should provide a limit on the number of additional rural lots in order to restrict development sprawl into isolated areas that lack services or transportation. Sprawl into rural areas is contrary to the provincial policy statements and is neither environmentally nor fiscally responsible. As the district official plan states, a key objective of rural policy is, quote, to preserve the character of the rural area and large tracts of undeveloped lands for environmental protection and aesthetic purposes. If, count, if council wishes to increase the current rural lot creation limit, we recommend a modest increase of the limit, not a complete removal of the limit. Finally, we support the recommendations to create maximum site alteration and amenity areas, to increase lot area and frontage for new waterfront lots, to prohibit new lot creation on lakes requiring a causation study until the study is completed and any recommendations are implemented, and to develop regulations for short-term rentals. Thank you for allowing me to speak and for the tremendous dedication and effort you're making to develop an official plan that will help ensure that Muskoka's future is a healthy and sustainable one. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Applett. Okay, and Mr. Potto there. Elizabeth, thank you. Let's bring him in. Hi, can you hear me? 
I can, Frank, welcome. Thanks, sorry, it's uh, early morning here, so I should be better Kemp for video, but uh, listen, <laughs> I'm speaking in my personal capacity. I don't want to um, repeat uh, anything that Deb Martin Downs or Susan Eppler just said, I think I've made some great comments. Um, I want to, uh, I do want to repeat my thanks though for your hard work on this. And speaking in my personal capacity, in particular, the issue of uh, you know deeded access for waterfront lot creation. As you know, I live on an island. Uh, my island is relatively you know large. It could be subdivided. Um, I've tried to keep it the way it has been for over 100 years, which is intact. And I don't want to be put in a position where I'm forced to subdivide it prematurely if you pass a change to the OP that requires deeded access, which is what it will force me to do. I just want to be able to pass it to my children. Um, who are, you know, fourth generation Muskoka, just like uh, the mayor, he's got four generations of Muskoka in his family. I'd like to have four generations of Muskoka in my family. So I think actually what you've got in this latest draft is a improvement from the prior draft. And I think uh, Mr. McDonald, I compliment him for coming up with something that tries to balance, you know, property rights for island owners with the, you know, issue of having parking on the streets. I, I don't think requiring deeded access, I think that's a sledgehammer to solve the issue of parking on the streets. I think the new parking rules you promulgated recently, I sent a message to the mayor congratulating him and I meant for him to pass it on to all the um, council and to you, uh, Chair Bridgman. I think what you've come up with in the parking rules is a good solution to the parking problem. I think deeded access for island owners is a sledgehammer that's not required. I think what Mr. McDonald has proposed in this latest draft is a move towards a compromise that makes sense to promote the marinas. I'd ask you to also include not just marinas, but places like private associations or clubs. For example, I park my boat at the Muskoka Lakes Association. I've done so all my years as a member. I have a right to that on an ongoing basis. And uh, you know, unless the club closes, that's what I'll continue to do. And I think that's another uh, good solution to consider adding in your mode in the next draft. So I just wanna say thank you for listening to the comments of the many, many multi-generational island owners who don't want to be put in a position to have to flip their properties to developers. I think that if you push forward to require deeded access, I'll just give you one point. My parents, I parked my boat at my parents' house. They unfortunately live on a road where they have to share access with other people. So for me to get deeded access from my parents, I then have to go to every other person that's on that road, ask them to put deeded title on their property, which, you know, frankly, uh, severely demeans the value of their property. So their likelihood of giving it to me is very low. And so I do think that this requirement for long-term deeded access registered on title is a terrible burden on the property rights of island owners. And so I think coming up with a solution that balances the issue, I think the parking issue should primarily be addressed through the parking regulations as you've recently done, and I think done an excellent job of doing. So I ask you to you know, consider the environment, but I don't think the biggest threat to our township is lot creation from island owners. I think the biggest threat is you know, resort development where there's 10 to 20 times the development rights, as long as those remain resorts, I think you've got that in check. I don't think there's any resorts on island properties, so I don't think you need to require deeded access for island owners. I'll leave it to that, and thank you again for letting me speak. Thank you, Mr. Potter. All right, so I believe our next speaker uh, is Jason Sift. Good morning, Mr. Sift. Good morning, everyone. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, my name is Jason Sift. Um, I represent myself as a Muskoka taxpayer and employer, but also other businesses and individuals as, with our Muskoka. Thank you for the opportunity to speak here today. We, has, we have extensively reviewed the staff report along with memorandum by Meridian. I would like to commend staff and Meridian in preparing these documents. They are very straightforward, easy to understand and helpful. I will keep my comments to the recommendations as laid out by Meridian with only five minutes. I'm not able to speak to our entire submission or on the entire OP. New water access lots. We are happy to hear the recommendation with regards to new island lots will be reverted back to closer language from our previous OP for all the reasons Mr. Pato just stated. Um, in our opinion, uh, property owners should be, or uh, lower level boathouses, in our opinion, property owners should be allowed to choose how they use the lower level of their boathouse. We feel the new wording, accessory recreational floor area is agreeable. Sitting inside the boathouse or outside on the dock is really no different. As the report comments, this will help to keep the noise contained. An additional benefit that no one has talked about is the potential reduction in boats from closing in the slips. We look forward to seeing the final wording around this in the next draft. Lot frontages and new lot waterfront lots. 
We very much oppose this section in the draft of the new OP. It's already extremely hard to find lots over 300 feet. This change would again make Muskoka even harder to afford. afford. I ask, is this the goal? These increases in lot requirements will greatly impact families that are planning to sever new lots in the future for their children or grandchildren. I wanna know what is the science behind these numbers? What's telling us this is needed? Historic water sampling done by the District of Muskoka shows a general water quality improvement in most lakes. We believe that the minimum lot sizes are appropriate in the current OP. Causation studies. Prohibiting all new lot creation until getting a causation study is an overstep, considering the first study conducted on Peninsula Lake in 2019 did not provide conclusive findings. It must be recognized that conclusions of causation studies may not be definitive. How do you prohibit something when the results of the studies aren't definitive? This sounds like red tape being put up to slow down the process. Causation studies should only be used when where water quality indicators have identified concerns. Site plan approval. Currently site plan approval is taking over 60 days to complete in the township. This is double what the Planning Act allows for. If site plan approval is put on all waterfront lots in Muskoka Lakes, we'll see the number of applications grow by eight to 10 times. I would like to know how many new planners this means. I think we can agree site plan approval is an important tool that can help to catch issues before they happen, but it should only be used when proposed development is large enough to need it. Why is it needed for a dock or a boathouse? Why is it needed for an addition? Maximum amenity area. We oppose this newly created section in the draft OP. First, how it will be policed and measured. Is the township gonna require a survey? Rock in Muskoka is not square. It comes in many shapes and sizes. Talk about making things more confusing and less clear for property owners and contractors. This concept will be a nightmare to manage and it should be removed. The specific percent, uh, regulating site alterations. The specific percentages should be removed from the OP. These can be dealt with later in the site alteration bylaw if they are needed. As with the amenity area concept, exact percentages will be very hard to manage both from a policing standpoint and as a measurement. Recreational carrying capacity. RCC uses a complicated method to limit the number of waterfront lots based on the lake's surface area. There is no science behind the method that we have seen that we have seen to date. Therefore, it's questionable at best, particularly on lakes where a public there's public boat access. I might it might work on smaller lakes where there's only one dock boat per dock, but most cottages on the larger lakes have a number of boats. Boating on the larger lake is also not contained to the bay you live in. You're normally traveling to many bays. We believe RCC policy should be removed from the official plan entirely. Rural lot creation. Permanent residence and employment are tough in the Muskoka Lakes community due to the lack of affordable housing. We agree that we need to have more land available for people to buy off the water and to make it more affordable to live in Muskoka. So this is a good first step, but is not a solution to the problem. We need to make off water permanent housing a priority in our urban centers. This means funding to expand the urban areas in Ballon, Port Carling. Being told that servicing in Port Carling is at capacity and there's not seem to be any plans with a reasonable timeline to address this issue is unacceptable. We cannot delay any longer. The proposed official plan is more complex and con contains many more interrelated policies and cross references between different sections in the current official plan. Creating a more detailed and complex plan will pose a greater challenge for property owners and contractors to understand the applicable policies and more assistance from the township planning staff will be required. An increase in the number of amendments will be, required, will be required to the official plan because of the amount of detail and complexity included in the policies. Simple language is not being used. With restrictions lifted, we also recommend hosting a public, proper public meeting in regards to the proposed official plan, as this has all taken place during the pandemic. Are we going to govern oh, by the Ms. Mr. Swift here at, uh, Mr. Swift, yes, sorry, here at five minutes. Yes, so please minute. wrap it up. Yep. Every voice matters. We need to get a large part of the community involved in a conversation, not 500 of 12,000. That's around 4% involvement. We also need to be aware of the cumulative impact of the draft OP rules on top of rules. In closing, we look forward to seeing how the adjustments you talk about today will be outlined in the next draft. I will, if you would like me to repeat any of my questions, please let me know. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Okay, thank you, Mr. Sift. Okay, so up next, I know Mr. Crocker was listed on the agenda. I believe he's on holidays and Linda, and I've lost her full name. I am so sorry. Stroh? Aslan Stroh. Aslan Stroh. There she is. Ms. Aslan Stroh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. 
Uh, welcome. Would you have video? Uh, I should have. Uh... There you are. Okay. Oh, yeah. That's great. All right. So uh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Chair Bridgman and committee members. Uh, I am Linda Haslam Stroud. I'm a fifth generation uh, full time resident in the township of Muskoka Lakes. And I'm here on behalf of the Skelton uh, Lake Cottagers Organization. First, I would like to acknowledge the work that your committee has done on the OP and the countless hours that you have committed to the constituents of, of the township. I'm here to discuss aggr aggregates, section L6. And as you know, your planning committee directed the consultant to maintain the existing policy to locate new aggregate operations in close proximity to provincial highways. And it also identified aggregate operations to have a two kilometer setback from our lakes. So you may be asking why I'm here with your committee since you've already directed these two important clauses to be in the OP. The Skelton Lake Cottagers are very concerned with the verbiage in a memorandum submitted by the consultant to the planning committee dated March 15th and the comments made about your direction. Basically, it outlines two issues. And might I even suggest it encourages aggregate community uh, companies to appeal your directions. That opinion is now on the public record and thus the Skelton Lake Cottagers organization believes we need to provide the rationale and set the record straight. First issue as far as the location of aggregate operations within close proximity of provincial highways. This is very important, as you know, it keeps heavy trucks, toxic dust, excessive noise, potential groundwater contaminants away from our small hamlets, our rural communities, and especially our lakes. And it also helps to improve the safety of our communities at large by keeping excessively large trucks off of our community roads. The PPS even states that aggregate operations be available as close to markets as possible. The SLCO and many constituents support the sourcing and the production of new aggregate operations as close to the main arteries that lead to the main markets, which I think we can all agree is Southern Ontario. This is not inconsistent with the uh, PPS. And as I mentioned, uh, we are pleased to see that this policy remains in the new OP. The second issue, we're also pleased that you elected to maintain and enhance the two kilometer setback for new aggregate operations from the waterfront designation. This is vitally important to protect the crown jewels that Muskoka is so famous for and that fuel our tourism based local economy. The verbiage by the consultant, I think it's on page 2324, indicates that there is no known basis for your policy direction regarding the two kilometer setback from lakes. There was a basis in our present OP, and there is a basis going forward. You know, we in Muskoka, as we know, derive our livelihoods from attracting visitors and seasonal residents to our pristine waters, our natural heritage, and historic uh, important towns and villages. And in keeping with the PPS, you are protecting the environment and natural resources, wetlands, woodlands, and water. The Skelton Lake Cottagers hope that the consultant's comments do not undermine your direction. We agree with your direction to keep aggregate operations in close proximity to provincial highways and over the two kilometers for our precious lakes. If we look back over, oh, it's over two years now, I guess, when we were invited to provide input to improve and strengthen the existing OP. Uh, for the aggregate section, we have had to advocate just to maintain what was there. And we feel there's really been a consistent effort to weaken the present OP aggregate section. The, the present aggregate policy was credible, succinct, easy to understand while meeting the provincial needs. It struck a balance to protect the sensitive nature of Muskoka, Muskoka, also called out for in the PPS, and it took up only two pages. The proposal now has a seven page cut and paste of the aggregate section of the PPS. We therefore are requesting that you simplify the aggregate section by referring to the PPS and then listing the municipal specific policies, including the two areas that you have consistently supported. And in this way, you might not require uh, amendments in the future when the PPS is amended. In closing, for the record, let me state that these two clauses in the aggregate policy you have uh, directed to be included, close proximity to provincial highways and a two kilometer setback from our pristine lakes have widespread support from the Muskoka Lake, uh, Small Lake Coalition, the MLA, the Friends of Muskoka and a wide swath of constituents from Muskoka Lakes. These clauses need to 
be recognized and properly enshrined in our OP now and forever. They are just as important, we believe, as all of the other policy policies to protect our lakes and natural heritage. I again, thank you for your work and thank you for the support of our lakes. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. hassan -Strapp. Thank you. Okay, now we are going to move on to our supplementary agenda um, speakers who have two minutes each. And the first one is uh, Ralph Culham. So Elizabeth, why don't we bring Bob Clark in at the same time and then we, we won't be waiting for him. Welcome, Mr. Cullum. Can you hear and see me? I can. Thank oh, you thank very. You. Okay, thank you. So please, just your name and address, and then you have two minutes. Um, sure. So please carry on. My name is Ralph Cullum, and I'm in at 105 Alexander Street in Gravenhurst, Ontario. Thank you, Mayor Bridgman, or Chair uh, Bridgman, and uh, Mayor the mayor and the councillors for letting me speak today on my behalf. Uh, my, again, my name is Ralph Cullum and I considered Muskoka to be my home for many years. I'm the chair of the Gravenhurst Accessibility Advisory Committee and I have experience in both design and engineering the building industry spanning five decades, including the design of an accessible R2000 home for my parents built in Gravenhurst in the mid 1980s. The Ontario government has a goal to have the province accessible by 2025, which is only three years away. Under the Accessibility for Ontario's and Disability Act, the AODA, there is a built environment accessibility standard that has yet to be enacted. The government plans to enact a standard by amendment to the Ontario Building Code. My contention is that the proposed restriction to a 1,000 square foot single story dwelling for small lots does not consider the increased living space requirements to make a dwelling accessible. To be accessible, bathrooms, hallways, kitchen, doorways, and other living spaces need to be larger in area. In addition, depending on grade elevations, accessible entry ramps may be quite large. I would like to see more flexibility in the official plan to consider the additional space requirements for accessible dwellings so that they have similar, similar functionality of a standard 1,000 square foot dwelling. In the case of small lots, this could include the ability to either construct or renovate the dwelling to either have a larger footprint or to be either a story or a story and a half or two story unit that could include a lift. In addition, the accessibility entry ramp should not be considered part of the footprint calculation. With the economic pressure on affordable housing for seniors and those with disabilities, existing garages could be converted to accessible dwelling spaces for family members. In this case, allowing the construction of a canopy to provide shelter for egress of both the building and the vehicle, even on small lots, should be considered. I have less concern for additional requirements to maintain functionality of accessible buildings on small lots than I do of the environmental impact and energy consumption of a large- Mr. Resident. Mr. Cullum, you are at two minutes. Could I ask you to wrap it up, please? I'm, I'm just, yeah, I'm just there. Uh, built on lakefront properties. For the most part, the changes that suggest for small lots have less impact on the existing grade levels, trees and plantations and tearing down of a cottage close to the waterfront for the building of a new resident meets the 66 foot setback requirement. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. All right, um, Mr. Clark. Welcome, Mr. Morning. Hi, hopefully I don't have technical problems today. Um, Thank you, Chair Bridgman, Planning Committee, Staff, Council, um, for your extensive and hard work. Um, as you know, I've been involved in this process uh, for 18 to 24 months uh, as part of the special committee uh, reviewing the official plan. Um, DLP is very complicated. Uh, commend you on the work and even understanding not just the process, but what's involved in it. Um, I would really suggest that with all of these changes, et cetera, that we ask staff to put a document together showing what it would actually take to create a lot and what it would take to create a building permit on a going forward basis. It's going to be extremely difficult. And I'm sorry, I've got to turn this thing off or we're going to get back to you. Um, finally, during the time that I was on this committee, and I'm sorry I have to keep it short, but 
Um, I've asked a few hard questions to the process that I, and I've really been astonished at some of the answers that uh, I got back when they were put forward. A lot of it is, you know, where did the numbers come from uh, in this draft OP? How do we actually come up with numbers? And in a lot of cases, the answer is, well, we had to start somewhere, so we just picked one. I don't think that's a good answer. I ask how many properties will this impact and change? And the answer is we don't really know and it would take a lot of work to get it, but apparently we have a lot of the information. Um, finally, what will the cost be the taxpayer of implementing these terms in terms of implementation, staffing, buildings? Um, to my surprise, I can't get a budgetary answer on this and it doesn't show in any of the ongoing new budgets if this does get implemented. So what I would ask, and I think we learned this last week, is simply let's remove a lot of the numbers as it relates to what's happening in this OP and get them into bylaws like the site alteration bylaw, which we had fantastic interchanges on last week. So we can actually vet the numbers. Council will know where the numbers come from. They'll actually be scientifically based. They'll be researched. And we won't just use the word environment. We all love the environment here. We all want it to stay the way it is or improve, but it doesn't mean just piling on more restrictions. It means doing our homework. Thank you very much. I'm pretty sure I'm at my two minutes, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Clark, I was just about to let you know that. So thank you very much for keeping it at two minutes. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Okay, so that is the end of our delegations. And I do want to note, uh, for those of you looking at the agenda, that um, Mr. Newman did withdraw his five-minute delegation request. Um, I had it crossed off on mine, but I forgot to mention it. So, okay, thank you, everybody, for your, for your input. Um, now, um, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond, welcome again, and uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm wondering, Mr. McDonald, I have all my notes here sort of on 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 uh, on your report. Can we do this sort of section by section in terms of your questions and your recommendations uh, rather than review it all at once? And then I think that just keeps us helps us keep being focused, if that's good with you. That, that's perfectly fine with me. That makes the most sense. There's a lot of information here and I, I think it makes sense to look at it uh, individually. Uh, there are 14 separate recommendations. So there'll be 14 separate little presentations that won't be very long uh, to get us into those recommendations and then we can discuss them. Okay, and, and to our delegates, I believe that a lot of what you've asked or said will come up during this, during this discussion. So Mr. McDonald, can we start with minimum lot coverage? Minimum law coverage. I was going to go in the order of the uh, memorandum itself, if that's okay. Um, um, that's fine. Where, where would you like to start? Great. So I'm just going to start on the first page with water access lots. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just just going to follow uh, in the in the order of my recommendations from one to fourteen. So I'll do it that way. Um, so as as you already know, uh, this issue has uh, uh, consumed a significant amount of time and discussion, and there has been a lot said about this uh, particular issue. Um, as you know, the existing official plan um, states that new water access lots can only be created provided long-term uh, uh, parking facilities are provided, and this has meant historically uh, that the applicants have to provide a letter uh, from a marina indicating that the field could vehicular parking was available um, and the owner would be uh, required to enter into an agreement um, that would um, require owners to not utilize public parking and docking as a means of access to the property. Um, waterfront access lots, uh, water, sorry, waterfront landings are also an alternative uh, long-term access uh, possibility in the township as well. So through the process of developing the official plan, there's been lots of discussion and a lot of back and forth on this particular issue. And in the end, uh, it was directed that the official plan contain policies that require deeded access uh, only uh, in cases where water access lots uh, were proposed. So the above, policy, the above policy direction was then implemented to basically permit uh, water, water access on a mainland waterfront landing individual water access point or a plan of condominium involving boat slips. And all of those circumstances would have required some form of deeded access. 
Uh, we also included as an additional option in the draft official plan, uh, new policies on individual water access points, which would serve up to two residential lots that cannot be accessed by a road. Um, and those, uh, uh, those permissions would be enshrined in your implementing zoning bylaw when it is updated in the future. However, and notwithstanding that, there would still be a requirement for deeded access even in those cases. In response to the survey question on whether this was a good idea or not, it was basically split, 52 saying yes, and 48% 48 saying, 48 saying no. And based on a review of these comments, uh, those that were opposed were, were uh, to the idea generally indicated that the potential was very remote for securing deeded access or an easement on a property. Um, and those in favor uh, believe that the long-term parking of cars and trailers should not be occurring on roads and should be occurring in places where uh, there was uh, uh, confirmed and long-term access. Uh, after thinking about it and looking at all of the comments, I don't think personally uh, that this is the most appropriate way to deal with the issue uh, with access. I don't think it's very likely that deeded access will be secured. I don't, it, waterfront property is very expensive. Uh, folks are not going to be consenting to uh, granting easements or having easements on their property. It reduces the value and their saleability over the long term. Uh, so as a consequence, I don't think it will be possible to really implement this policy. Um, so with this in mind, it is my recommendation that the requirement for deeded access not be carried forward into the next draft and that a long-term lease agreement with the marina be considered an acceptable additional option. So what I'm suggesting is that the deeded access piece come out. Um, we do, I do recommend that the uh, po new policies on individual water access points be carried forward into the next draft. And when these policies are implemented in the township zoning bylaw, another option will be made available. So in addition, uh, I also recommend that the official plan include a policy that requires the owners of lots to enter into an agreement with the township that indicates that they will not park or moor watercraft on municipal lands to access their property. So as a consequence, what I'm suggesting is an enhancement of the status quo with one additional option for consideration, that being the individual water access points. So going to recommendation number one uh, in the memorandum, um, I'll summarize and not read this, but deeded access not be a requirement. It can still obviously be an option available to an owner uh, if desired. Uh, a new policy be included in the official plan that requires new lots, the owners of new lots to act to enter into an agreement with the township that indicates they will not park uh, vehicles or more watercraft on municipal lands, as well as binding provisions that deal with the circumstance where the marina ceases to operate, which could happen and hopefully doesn't. Uh, the draft policies would also permit individual water access points on private properties and that that be carried forward into uh, the next draft of the official plan with the requirement that there be a long-term lease on those individual water access properties as well. And that lastly, the official plan contains supportive language uh, that supports the retention of existing marinas and the reasonable expansion of these marinas in the future. So that's recommendation number one, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald's. And I don't know if you had a chance to see uh, Mr. Morgan's letter with the wording. I assume that you will take that into consideration going forward. Uh, yes, I will, Chair Bridgman. Uh, his suggestions were uh, very well uh, taken. I'm not sure I would incorporate all of the language he has suggested because it is kind of legalese for an official plan, um, but I understand his points and we'll consider them. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I agree with the recommendation. Uh, point B, the uh, new policy requiring owners uh, doing last enter in agreement with the township. I appreciate my own vehicles, but what about guest vehicles? Um, people regularly come up and, and they need extra places to park. Uh, do we want to put a provision in there? Do we want to understand that? Um, you know, we do have on-street parking for guests and overflows and even the mainland properties. If you happen to have uh, a number of people over, sometimes they do park on the road or do we want a limitation or we want to just even ask the question of what guest parking um, in that agreement, what the plan is for guest parking. So we have an idea for that. Thank you. Okay, Mr. McDonald. I think uh, through you, to, chair, uh, through you to, to the mayor, I think that's an excellent suggestion. Um, 
not sure how exactly we would operationalize something like that, but I think it's worth uh, asking the question and considering it. Uh, and perhaps there could be uh, in the agreement some acknowledgement that guest parking for up to a certain number is, is also incorporated, but anything above that isn't. Uh, so we'd have to look at that and think about it, but I think you're on the right track. I think that's a good idea. Okay, thank you. Um, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, I generally agree uh, with the changes that are proposed. I do have three questions uh, specifically relating to uh, the addition of a long-term lease with a marine operator. Uh, number one, I don't know what long-term means, two years, five years, 20 years. Uh, number two, um, I don't know, I, I, this isn't effective unless we have some way to try to establish a an, an estimate of an appropriate number of parking spaces and whether that's tied to the number of bedrooms or the square footage of the of the specific cottage or whatever it is, I don't know, but one's not ever gonna be enough. And the more troubling one is the last one. And I know we had this debate earlier in, on another issue, but the issue of uh, the last line, binding provisions that deal with a circumstance where the marina ceases to operate. I have no idea what binding provisions could be put in place that would be effective through a bankruptcy. Uh, and as a result, I don't know what that means. So those are my questions, thank you. Fair enough, Mr. McDonald. Uh, through, you, uh, through you, Chair Bridgman, that's an excellent question about the binding provisions. I've been thinking about that as well. I'm gonna ask Mr. Pink to provide his thoughts because he assisted with this as well too. Uh, but certainly if a marina closes, the marina has gone. It's pretty hard to force uh, someone to park at something that doesn't exist anymore. And I don't think we're suggesting that uh, if the marina is gone, that somehow the person can't occupy his property anymore. So I, I don't think that's in the cards either. Um, so it's a good question. It's something we need to think about. Um, we do need to think about circumstances where marinas cease. Um, maybe we think about including backup plans or backup strategies in these agreements as well in those kinds of cases. Um, but I don't have a good answer for you right now. It's something uh, we wanted to run by this committee and get their thoughts on, and we'll certainly explore it uh, further. Uh, Mr. Pink, anything you can add to that? Mr. Pink? Good morning, committee. Uh, similar to what Mr. McDonald has said, I think um, keep in mind at this level, these are official plan policies and a lot of these finer details we worked out in negotiations in crafting those agreements when they're approved as conditions of consent. So exactly how many years, how many vehicles it may depend again on the size of the lots, uh, the number of lots, um, you know, the intended usage, et cetera. And, and again, it's a, certainly an excellent question. Um, in regards to when a marina ceases to operate. But I think, as Mr. McDonald noted, I think there needs to be some recognition that that could occur. And if that were to occur, uh, those owners are obligated to uh, ensure that they're not going to revert to utilizing public docking, public parking, and that they will seek out either another marina or a waterfront landing or needed access, uh, et cetera. And it will obligate them to do so. Um, uh, the exact details, again, we can uh, work out as we work uh, negotiate these agreements, but I think um, something to recognize uh, uh, that that's a possibility and certainly echo Mr. McDonald's comments. There's no intention to uh, strip the ability for someone to uh, inhabit their property or, or access it, but we want to ensure that appropriate access continues to be uh, available. Okay, thank you. And then on the issue of the uh, the term of the contract, I'm going to ask Mr. Diamond to provide his thoughts on that in terms of how long the lease should be for with the marina operator. Okay, Mr. Diamond, welcome. Good morning. Um, this is a lot of this, um, including the number of parking spaces, is a bylaw issue. Um, and um, I know we've been criticized for having too many numbers in the uh, in the official plan already. Um, in terms of the um, the opportunity for a long-term lease, of course, under the planning act, you can do a lease for 21 years, less a day without getting planning act approval. Um, but that, and that's important because that lease also is a binding contract between the property owner and the person who is counting on that land for deeded access. Um, 
I've seen this situation occur before where that binding contract, then if there's a bankruptcy with the marina, it's a contract that, uh, that flows through. I don't know all the legal obligations, but when you have a long-term contract, it does provide better security for um, ensuring that that requirement to provide that access is maintained and is tied to the, tied to the property. Um, but it can't be for more than 21 years without planning approval of some sort. Okay, thank you, Mr. Diamond. Uh, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, and through you, just two quick comments. The first was just um, when the mayor was talking about visitors or a to uh, a, an, a, an island property, I think that also extends to the construction and service industry as well, because that has been a bit of an issue. So uh, just as he brought that up, I just think we need to also be contemplating how we, <coughs> excuse me, um, address that. And the second thing I wanted to pick up on, I think it was Mr. Pato's comments. We're talking about marinas right now, but there are quite a few of our constituents who actually do use private clubs as their primary parking. And I'm not sure how that could, not that I'm not sure. I, I just would like to support his comment that that should be contemplated as well. Thank you. Mr. McDonald, we could just add that in as part of the uh, deemed agreements, I would think. Yes, I would agree with that. That was an excellent suggestion he made. Okay. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I have great difficulty with this, but I do understand the program. It's quite clear that the current situation is unacceptable, as has been uh, uh, pointed out lately. So here, here are my comments. In, in Mr. McDonald's notes, he indicates that um, the official plan proposes to substantially increase the minimum lot sizes for island lots and there'll be fewer of them. So I would like to have this subject revisited in the event that those restrictions or those uh, further um, things are not implemented. So, so that's number one. Um, number two is when you talk about a, a, a lease 21 years less a day, I assume when you're talking about it carrying forward, you're talking about it being registered on title to the marina. I assume that's what you're talking about, because if that lease is only registered, is only between the operator of the marina and that person, then if the operator fails to meet his obligations, that lease will be lost. So that causes a great problem. And I also understand that the official plan is not the place to put zoning restrictions but it should set the framework for it. And I believe the framework here uh, should be that, that there a lot not be created unless there's satisfaction that there is a long-term lease for the assumed people that will be using that lot. And that's, that's difficult and may have to be done on a, on a case by case basis. But if you allow the lot to be created, without something, then we'll be back in the situation of Walker's Point, where when that parking that those people relied upon is maybe in jeopardy or they have more people, then those people come back to the municipality. So I understand it's a difficult subject and I, I think we're moving in, a, in the right direction because I do think needed access, although it would solve the problem is probably unworkable. So I'm in, I'm, I'm, I'll support this going forward, but. I think the OP has to address it. It can't just be silent and leave it to um, an individual consideration. So that's, those are my comments. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. I'd be interested in hearing your comments on, on uh, not being silent and law creation can't happen until we know that there's a lease. Would, uh, is that part of an OP? Yeah, it is. And, and how I envision the policies working is that uh, when someone makes an application for consent, they have to demonstrate that they're conforming with the official plan and what it says. And if the official plan requires someone to demonstrate that they have a, a solution for access over the long term, that needs to be furnished and considered by the Committee of Adjustment when the application is initially being heard by them. If they're satisfied, then the committee would then attach a condition to their decision, which requires them to furnish the actual contract or the lease or whatever it is 
prior to the committee and the township signing off on the new lot being created. So there are two steps involved uh, in, in going through this process. And uh, I think that provides uh, enough security to the township that there will be uh, that access provided. In the end, there always will be a circumstance where something doesn't work out as planned. That's life. The best we can do is try to make sure that doesn't happen uh, through the application process. Okay, thank you. And and the question about being registered on title with the marina, I found that interesting. Is that something that we can dictate? I would have to think about that a little bit more, and unless David or Jim has a comment on that. Um, I, I'm Registering something on title typically happens when you have some kind of planning act approval or some long-term arrangement in place. It doesn't typically happen for anything that is short term, but I get the idea because the operator of the marina may be different than the owner of the marina. So that's something to think about uh, going forward. Um, I would ask to leave that with us unless Mr. Diamond or Mr. Pink has a thought on that. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go with Mr. Diamond and then Mr. Pink. Mr. Diamond? Thank you. Um, I want to preface this by saying that we have boosted up the policies that support marinas in the official plan and provided some greater flexibilities for those marinas to operate. At the same time, they're all subject to site plan control. And at some stage, someone is going to have to look at the marinas in Muskoka Lakes and in a perfect situation, do it in conjunction with the township of Seguin and say, how many water access lots are there now and how many parking spaces are there now? And, um, and determine what, what the real supply and demand is. But through the site plan approval process with the marinas, we can tie them into a number of parking spaces and the use of those parking spaces, but it requires um, a site plan agreement between the marina operator and the municipality to do that. It's a complicated process. Sometime down the road, probably something the township will have to do. S supplementary? Oh, sorry. It's Oh, just let, let's let Mr. Pink um, make his comment first, uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Mr. Pink. Thank you, uh, thank you Chair. Uh, that's right. uh, just quickly, uh, I think it's important to note that the long-term lease agreement is obviously uh, a contract or an agreement between two other parties that the municipality is not a party too, so is between the marina and the property owner. Um, but further to the previous points we've made about, uh, and this already occurs, we already have required for many years um, an agreement registered on title between the municipality and the property owner that they are not going to utilize municipal docking and parking. And as we talked about just a moment ago, uh, as well as binding provisions that deal when um, with the circumstance where the marina ceases to operate, the way I envision part of the implementation in addition to what Mr. McDonald said is that consent agreement that recognizes they're not gonna utilize municipal docking and parking will also reference the long-term lease with that marina or waterfront landing or what have you, or we haven't talked about the deeded access is still an option available uh, to uh, an island owner, but you still need an agreement registered on title with the municipality that will bind those two properties together, or uh, in the case of a marina or waterfront mm -hmm. landing, um, that a long-term lease agreement shall be in place um, to our satisfaction. So there's some interplay there, but I think uh, Mr. McDonald outlined uh, how I envision the process to be implemented. Those details will have to be provided with the application, and if approved by committee, um, they will have to fulfill conditions which include agreements with uh, other parties and with the municipality. I hope that helps clarify. Okay, thank you. Uh, supplementary, uh, Councillor Jagowitz? Yes, I just wanted to follow on, on that. And um, I wasn't referring to a registration on title of the island. I was referring to a registration on title for the person providing the access. And it's the similar to when a person attains a right of way, and I know this because I just went through some personal experience. When you obtain a right of way over somebody else's property, you can register it on title to that person's property. And that's good for this 21 years less a day. If you want permanent access, you have to go through a land severance and get the municipality involved, okay? I don't think that's, that's what I envision. I just envision that the long-term lease would be registered on the property of the marina or the or the uh, private club 
or the individual's property who's providing the access. That gives some degree of assurance without inter uh, interfering. Uh, without that registration, it's kind of a useless document. But uh, I'll leave it at that point because I understand we're getting into the nitty gritty now. But I think the OP should have some strong wording that it's not just a letter from a marina or an agreement that lasts for five years with a five-year renewal. That, that's not a long-term lease in my view. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you very much, Sir Prisman. Uh, I think this could be a, a, a winning situation for everybody. If I owned a marina and I had a 21 year lease from, from Islanders, one, it would help my uh, business plan if I was borrowing. Two, if I was to sell the marina, I could then say I've got so many leases with, with 20 years left, so many with 15 years left, so that it would make the marinas more viable. Not only that, if they were wanted to increase their, their parking, they could say, you know, island or number one wants three parking spaces, another one wants four or something like that. So it would help that. So I think this is a, a win-win. I wouldn't burden people with, with having uh, deeded access on the, uh, on the water. It's just too uh, cumbersome. But I think it would help our uh, marinas uh, and that become more viable than that. And uh, I think it's a win for everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Mayor Harding. Thank you. Um, as far as registration of this lease on the marina's lands, I think that's a little bit onerous on the marina. Um, adds extra legal costs. And we are really, I think Mr. Potto commented, we're dealing with a sledgehammer to solve a, a small problem at the end of the day. I think the bigger problem, and I, I love where the way the direction is going and that we have to demonstrate we have a lease. But the real problem that we have not really identified in this official plan is I'll take Parker's Marina, for example, where you can park 500 boats. What happens if that marina closes? We're talking about dealing with the one or two new lot creation annually on islands. But we have forgotten about the thousands upon thousands of current water access only people that we are not supporting in this official plan to help encourage. We dealt with Skeleton Lake recently where a marina was threatening to close and we had to look at different alternatives to make sure we protected that water access landing for those properties. And I'm, I'm wondering, is there a policy that we wanna consider that encourages continued use or expansion of waterfront landings in here because the problem is not the one or two new lots the problem is the thousands of existing lots should these marinas decide they want to get out of that business and don't like renting boat slips uh the, this very good point you're hurting and mr mcdonald would that would that fold into our marina section thoughts on that uh, yes, uh, uh, Chair Bridgman, that's an excellent suggestion. I, I guess what we're all trying to say is that marinas and waterfront landing serve a greater long-term public interest um, in terms of providing long-term access to those folks that need it. And I think uh, along the lines of what the mayor is suggesting, that the official plan should be supportive of retaining existing landings and existing marinas. So when we say in item D of the recommendation, I think that should be expanded to include waterfront landings as well, so that we're clear on it. Um, and we'll, we'll consider how we can further support that through the policy framework we develop after this meeting. Uh, but I think both of those things should be supported going forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you. Um, further to, to the, the uh, mayor's point, there are thousands and thousands of, of uh, boats being parked at, at, at somewhere like, like uh, Parker's or other landings. We should maintain them. They've, they've got to be saved because uh, a resort closes. Yes, you lose some, some jobs and everything else for that. If these marinas or landings close, there's millions of dollars on these islands that are up the creek 
basically without somewhere to, to uh, park. So we've, we've got to make it as strong as, as possible on not down zoning marinas or or uh, or uh, uh, or other, other uh, landings that, that there are there because it is important to the whole area. Thank you. We'll see how Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond work their magic on the wording of that, Councillor Edwards. Uh, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you, it's for you, and uh, I support those comments. I, um, I, I am also wondering, and I, if, if we could have a clear definition of the difference between a marina and a landing. Just coming out of our meetings from last week, I, I realized that we don't really have a clear understanding of those. Um, and then again, extending it just beyond the world of marinas, it, it, Mr. Potter brought up the, the Gulf and Country Club. I have no idea how many uh, people we are talking about there, but I've, I suspect there's quite a few that may use that as their primary data plot. And I know there's multiple spots, like that's right, the, the lakes. So um, we just ask that those definitions are clear as well. Thank you. So Mr. McDonald, Councillor Mazan raised this last week. And I think the defining difference is it, whether it's zoned commercial or whether it's, it's zoned non-commercial, but in terms of the actual um, listing of what's allowed and not allowed, I think that's, if I can, Councillor Mazan, that's where you're coming from. So I don't know, more than explaining that, I don't really have any more comments. I don't know if you wanna make a comment on that. Um, actually, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Pink to provide his thoughts. I mean, he's been dealing with this for years, so he can probably unpack the differences uh, better than I. Mr. Pink. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think uh, at the onset, what I would say is it's largely a zoning bylaw definition matter, not so much uh, an official plan uh, policy getting into the distinction between the two. But I think the discussion last week um, really revolved around there's obviously different uh, service levels uh, in a marina. And I think uh, we were struggling with um, trying to define that uh, for that specific property. But our zoning bylaw currently does contain clear definitions of a marina, and it currently uh, contains a clear definition of a landing. But the definition of a marina is, I think as it needs to be, somewhat flexible. It may have uh, boat sail, it may have uh, boat repair, uh, may have boat hire, um, may have boat storage uh, and access to the lake and it can be any combination of those things uh, but it's difficult when we want to be more prescriptive and say it, it must sell fuel uh, or it must repair boats so the definition is is somewhat flexible but there is that commercial component uh, where a landing predominantly doesn't have those additional services but does provide the access uh, to water body. I think the overarching uh, theme here I think we're supportive of the direction uh, that Mr. McDonald is suggesting we go. It resolves the concerns we've heard. I think the other piece, I think it's very well taken and it is noted in D that we need to be very supportive of the existing marinas and landings. Uh, the D just states marinas. I think we can certainly include uh, landings in that as well. The current official plan actually goes so far as identifying marinas as employment lands. Um, I question the appropriateness of that, but we will make sure uh, in the next draft that the policies are very clear uh, and provide very uh, large hurdles in order to downzone uh, a marina property. Uh, the other thing, and I think it's a broader discussion, but it did come up during the General Finance Committee uh, discussion on Skeleton Lake uh, last week. As committee members are aware, uh, the municipality is also going through a transportation master plan. And through that process, uh, council could explore uh, the utilization of uh, municipal lands for parking and docking as a potential solution if marinas uh, and landings uh, do uh, reduce in number and access becomes an issue. So I think that will become part of that process discussion. Uh, but through this OP, we will ensure uh, supportive policies for marinas and landings, uh, make it very difficult to or discourage their, um, their businesses uh, closing. Um, and, uh, and I think, again, we've, we made some good suggestions, um, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Diamond on, um, on pivoting on this uh, policy direction. I hope that helps clarify. 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Pink. Okay, so Mr. McDonald, uh, Mr. Diamond, I believe we, you obviously have support for the direction that this is going in. And then we had a few other items that I'm sure you have, um, you will contemplate, which is the guest parking um, and uh, the private clubs, the lot creation really tied up, tightened. And um, and then the other issue that the mayor raised was, what do we do when a marina closes down with all of our island property? So I think I captured the, the main part of that. So if you're good with that, then we will, we will um, carry on to the next one. But I'm going to suggest a 10 minute break right now, just before we, we do that. Uh, so if we could all come back at 1015, that would be great. I'm sorry, 1025. <laughs> that would be good. Okay, thanks.
Okay, if I can get everybody back, please. We don't quite have quorum yet. Okay. Um, okay, welcome back. Um, Mr. McDonald, before we head into both houses, which I believe is, a, is the next one, I just wanted to quickly, um, the accessibility for, for the disabled or, or those that are having difficulty with that, is there a need to put that in an official plan if we're doing measurements on something and it doesn't quite fit into it. How do we handle that going forward? Because I was a it was a I think it was a point that needs to be addressed and people understand that it would be accommodated. I think it's an excellent point, uh, Chair Bridgman, and how it can be dealt with in the official plan is it can say that exceptions to any maximum dwelling unit sizes in the zoning bylaw may be considered in circumstances where there is a desire to improve a dwelling or build a dwelling uh, that is accessible uh, to those that require it. Um, I've written many zoning bylaws and many of the zoning bylaws I write basically exempt ramps and other elements uh, of entrances into dwellings from any setbacks as an example. Um, so we can provide direction in the official plan for there to be some flexibility in the zoning bylaw on how that is handled. Uh, in terms of minimum dwell or maximum dwelling unit sizes, um, that could be a consideration um, uh, that would support a minor variance request or uh, allow for uh, some change in the rules on a case-by-case -case basis, and we can set that up in the official plan. Okay, thank you. I think helpful for everybody listening. Um, Councilor Jagowitz, your hand is up. I'm, I, I is, do you have a question? I actually, I would like to uh, raise a point of order or procedure. Uh, it's very simple. Um, it, it, may I proceed on that? Yeah, well, let's hear. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Um, um, we've just dealt with one of 14 items. This could be a lengthy meeting. It was suggested at other meetings that, that the chair enforce uh, uh, each member to only speak once on a subject. And, and it would be helpful to me if, if I understood if that's the way you're going to proceed or would I be allowed to speak multiple times? It, it, uh, so I, I would appreciate if you would just uh, let us know whether it's acceptable for a member to speak more than once on a subject. Thank you. Okay, so we're into Robert's rules now. Uh, thank you for that. My suggestion uh, is, uh, because I don't want to uh, have the, a hard hammer here, but would everybody think about what they want to say first, please? Say it, and then if you really feel there is something more to add, add it in, and let's try to keep at the most um, two comments per councillor, but I understand what you're saying, Councillor Jagowitz. We spent 45 minutes on the first item that we all agreed with. <laughs> so um, let's just keep that all in mind here. Okay, Mr. McDonald, let's go on to our main floor of boathouses. Great, uh, thank you, uh, Chair Bridgman. And I'll try to keep my comments brief on all of these intro items um, or all of these items. I, I know everyone on this committee has read everything already, so we can just cut to the chase as much as we possibly can. So with respect to boathouses, the uh, draft official plan uh, included a policy that basically said uh, the ground floor of boathouses uh, can only be used for the storage of boats and non-hazardous boating equipment. Um, that was uh, the direction provided by planning committee uh, that went out, of course, uh, in the draft official plan. And we asked the question on whether that was acceptable or supportable. And again, we had a split of 51% saying no and 49% saying yes. And, and looking at this issue and in thinking about it further and after reviewing all of the comments uh, made, uh, it's it, the township already permits uh, boathouses to be used for a whole variety of purposes. Uh, if a second story boathouse is permitted, a habitable floor space is permitted in that second story. If you only have a one story boathouse, you can put a sun deck on top of that one story boathouse. And in addition, in the first floor of a boathouse, you can also have a separate washroom um, as well in a separate room. And those are as of right permissions uh, from uh, the township's zoning bylaw. 
And I know, um, and I've certainly heard through anecdotal evidence, there have been lots of circumstances where folks are, are con converting parts of, uh, or even all of the bottom floor of their boathouses for into living space. And I don't think that's appropriate, uh, but I do think that there is, uh, there is the potential to be a bit more flexible in terms of how we approach this issue. And I'm certainly, uh, uh, and what I'm thinking is that we could uh, incorporate policies in the official plan that allows for some recreational floor area in the first story of a boathouse. It can't be habitable, it can't be used for sleeping accommodation, and it should be limited in size. And the working number we have is somewhere between 50 and 70% of a boathouse should be open to the water below. So it's basically being used for its primary purpose, which is the storing of boats. But there, there could be a consideration for permission in the zoning bylaw uh, for some type of recreational floor area permission in the remainder. I would note if that permission was there, uh, folks may be sitting inside their boathouses more than they're sitting outside of their boathouses, which I think many people would think is a good idea in terms of um, lessening impacts on quality of life and so on uh, from noise uh, from boathouses. So I'm recommending that there be a change in approach and that's in recommendation number two um, and that basically the official plan permit recreational floor area on the ground floor of boathouses, provide an appropriate percentage of the boathouse was utilized for marine storage and open to the water below. I don't suggest we put a number in the official plan. I'm very conscious about the many numbers we already have in the official plan, and, and I don't want to really start adding any more into it if we don't need to, um, but this is certainly more for the, by, for the zoning bylaw to consider, um, but I'm thinking that the door should be open for that to happen. So that's my recommendation. Okay, thank you. Any comments, committee? Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Thank you, Chair. I was afraid no one was going to speak on this issue, so so I apologize for going first. Um, once again, I have extreme difficulty with this. I understand where you're going with it. You don't want numbers in the official plan. But when you say that you can permit accessory recreational use on the ground floor, provide an appropriate percentage of the boathouse was utilized, that you can drive a truck through that. And um, someone can say, I don't have any boats, therefore an appropriate amount is the entire boathouse. So I think if you're going to allow this, the official plan has to be somewhat stronger. First of all, I'm not sure, I'm surprised that our director of uh, his full title is in agreement with this because when we dealt with uh, this a couple of last week, a similar issue having to do with outbuildings having a designated use, it's my understanding he was opposed to having other than habitable and storage. And now we're going down that slippery slope of creating a middle category called accessory recreational use. So um, I, I, uh, I have a lot of trouble with this. Uh, However, I do acknowledge that people should be able to, as some people have said, get out of the sun and, and you know, have a fridge uh, or something like that. But I, I think this is very, very, very weak. And I think leaving it to the uh, zoning bylaw is a mistake. Um, so I don't know how we deal with it, but I, I don't support it in its current form. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Zavitz. Thank you, and through you. So, you know, we, uh, I think as Councilor Jagowitz has just indicated, we, we struggled last week and, and we will continue to struggle here today with the word habitable. Um, it's just uh, talk about driving a truck through something. I guess I have two questions for my two questions. Number one, a general piece, which is if, um, if we allow the, if you will, the construction or the use of the lower level of a boathouse, for this application, then where do the boats go? Um, and you know, it makes me wonder, comma, you know, there, should there be a fine, have a, a certain amount of space in your lower level for um, whatever that recreational piece is, uh, but also, uh, you know, one boat slip, two boat slips. Where do the boats go if um, 
the whole space is used for recreation. Uh, we end up with problems like we've seen where people put lifts outside and cover, et cetera, et cetera, or we create larger boathouses uh, to compensate. So, you know, we're just put kicking a can down the road. So I'm concerned about that. So I'd like to hear from um, the committee, committee on that piece. And then I think just generally speaking, um, I'm going to be in support of some aspect of this and I've actually changed my mind on it. Um, and that's one of the good things about this process. Lots of hearing, lots of uh, listening, lots of reading, lots of seeing, I, I they're here. Um, and I don't wanna to seem to be a stick in the mud. People want them, clearly they're a, a vital piece of the Muskoka puzzle, it seems they're going to be. Um, I don't want to, uh, I want to acknowledge them in some way, thank you. Mr. McDonald. Yeah, just to quickly in response, uh, we're not suggesting that we support the, the use of the entire ground floor for recreational floor area. Um, that's not what we're suggesting. I, I guess we didn't have a number in mind, but if I could throw something out there, it would be no less uh, than 50% of the ground floor being reserved for boathouse, um, open to the water, marine storage kind of thing. So, I mean, we could consider a number like that. We're just not sure what the correct number is without doing some more testing. So we're not suggesting that. I'm not a big fan personally of habitable floor area. I think it's a challenging term, which could be interpreted many different ways. That's just my view. That's why I looked for something else. And, and, and I came up with recreational floor area with a clear prohibition on any sleeping uh, potential or accommodation. Uh, I'm also thinking of, of enforcement down the road and, uh, you know, when folks are already using the insides of boathouses for all kinds of different things, it's hard to even get into a boathouse unless you have, uh, for enforcement purposes, unless you, you know, have some pretty good evidence that something is, 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 is not happening in accordance with the bylaw. So I'm thinking of enforcement down the road as well, too. Um, so putting a number in the OP is not something I'd support, but if we wanted to consider no less than 50% being used for uh, marine storage and open to the water, we could look at that um, going forward. So just a thought for the conversation. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you and through you. Um, I, I've heard the argument that people want to get out of the sun and I can understand that. Um, what I would like to do is define a little bit better what you can do should you build in part of your boathouse and that is, it's it's not a living room. So there should be no television there. There should be no cooking facilities, no barbecue. And anything that you do put in there has to be removed seasonally um, because of the flooding. So anything, I don't want anything built in. Um, and I would like to stick completely with the two-piece washroom. That's all that we allow in a boathouse, no other plumbing. Um, and if we could do that with the, with a percentage to be determined later, um, I could support that, support that. But I would like the things that are in there to be removed during our spring for shut. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hayes. So are you you're including appliances and that kind of thing too, with the built-in kitchens and that kind of thing, right? Yes, I don't think we should have built-in kitchens in our boathouses. I think the kitchen belongs in the house because that's the use of the house. Um, if you want to bring down some food and have a, a, a patio table inside your boathouse and have lunch, that's fine. But um, Or have a mini fridge that's up two feet and you know it won't be um, affected by any flooding, then, then that's okay too. But anything that uh, is going to sit right on that floor and that includes built-in kitchens and anything like that should be removed seasonally to protect our environment. Okay, thanks for that clarification. Uh, um, Mayor Harding. Um, thank you. I, I like the recommendation uh, that is included. Um, I would include a uh, maximum use i mean as far as recreational i'd go to up to 50 percent. i think that number should be in there and i look at that like our 11 percent lot coverage um the specifics later on can be dealt with i think in a zoning bylaw 
but I don't mind a hard cap on how much of this area could be used. I think that also eliminates, especially if, it, if I call it 50% could be used for recreational, as you say, or amenity space um, versus the has to be open for a boat slip perspective. Um, and uh, I think that 50% also eliminates the, uh, the case where all of us saw a boat uh, house up on uh, Lake Joseph that was 100% decked in and all the boats were put outside. So I think that eliminates that as we move forward. As far as um, kitchen facilities and, you know, a sink to get a glass of water uh, or something along that, we're not putting, I don't believe anybody's ever, I've never seen a stove in a boathouse, but when we have a cottage 66 feet back, potentially up a long hill and people are up and down, um, I believe a two-piece washroom is appropriate in the boathouse. But um, the ability to have some glasses and a bar area and serve, I, I don't believe is inappropriate. And um, anybody who's building a new boathouse is building up to a higher flood elevation anyway. And, um, you know, propane tanks, uh, there's nobody, I don't, I've never seen a barbecue inside a boathouse. I don't think you can even legally do that. It's like putting a barbecue inside your cottage and it needs to be outside for ventilation. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure regulating kitchens. We have people who build boathouses and call them fish cleaning stations because they want a sink to wash dishes or wash their hands or get a glass of water. Let's call a spade a spade. It's a kitchen, but it doesn't have cooking facilities. And I like where Mr. McDonald's going, that it's not livable, habitable. I couldn't lock myself in this room for a week and live there. And I think uh, that's really where we need to go. Um, is there a TV in there? Honestly, who cares? Uh, it's indoors. Um, I'd rather see a TV inside the boathouse than on the outside wall of the boathouse, which we would technically allow at this particular point. And um, so I, I think the policy direction is correct. I, I don't want to be over prescriptive personally in the official plan, but I would look at a hard cap of 50% recreational space. Okay, thank you. Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, uh, I, I, I like uh, Councillor Zavitz have moved quite a bit on this, but for slightly different reasons. Uh, my general approach uh, on this has been uh, that boathouses are are essentially an intrusion on the natural rugged beauty of uh, of the Muskoka landscape, and they move development away from the buffer that we've identified as important when we when we prescribe where people can build habitable space. Um, what has always dictated the, the basically footprint of a boathouse has been the number of boats and the size of the boats that you're trying to house in it. And if we now decide that you can add or that you can occupy up to 50% of that boathouse, we've essentially doubled the footprint uh, of the boathouse on directly over the waterfront for activities that when we start kind of thinking maybe TVs are okay and maybe uh, kitchens are okay. Um, we, we've essentially doubled the footprint of the boathouse uh, on or over the water um, uh, for purposes that have nothing to do with storing boats or marine equipment. Now, here's where I've moved. Um, I, I, I don't have a boathouse in my place, but I do recall very uh, clearly when my kids were younger, uh, the boat tied to the dock became recreational floor space. When it was hot, the top went up and they would seek shelter. Uh, they'd go in there and have picnics in the boat tied to the side of the dock. So I understand the need and I understand the value of having something like that to escape the heat and the weather and, and, and maybe have a nap or whatever. No, you can't sleep, but whatever you do in, a, in a uninhabitable space. Uh, so I've moved a long way, but I have two comments on that. Number one, uh, I, I guess I care a little bit less about what's in it, except absolutely no partitions. It should be open space. A bathroom, if it's a two-piece bathroom off to the corner, obviously needs a partition. But everything else to me is open space. Uh, and, and number two, the real issue that I have and the real problem that I have is however we prescribe this, we have to be able to enforce it. And I really am tired of the notion that we're going to let neighbors rat on neighbors if behavior changes in one of these spaces. So somehow, and I realize it's not part of the official plan, we've got to sit back and figure out 
if we change our stand and when we change our stand and build this into the official plan, what's the mechanism for enforcement? What's the mechanism for auditing the use of the space, the contents of the, uh, of the uh, structure and, uh, and the compliance with whatever we come up with to define recreational floor space? The last thing, I don't know whether it's 50%, 20%, 30%, but no matter what it is, uh, I, I can't imagine that it should be larger than your ability to build a second floor accommodation. I don't think we need to have party palaces over the water with two bedrooms upstairs when you need to go to sleep. I, I, I really think there needs to be a much firmer uh, uh, containment. If it literally is an escape from the sun and a bit of a lounge, it doesn't need to be 2,500 square feet. Uh, it doesn't need to be 2,000 square feet. But uh, I generally support this trend towards recreational floor space with lots of caveats. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I, I guess it all goes to our own personal experiences. I have experienced where people have pretty much filled in most of the boathouse. Uh, there are slips, um, same thing, point, put the boats outside. Um, and full on kitchens, and in fact, sleeping accommodations. Um, while I may not wanna sleep in the boathouse that way for a week, whatever, how it was described, people are doing it. Um, I also know that some of those people, and that, that's how I found out about it, they contacted me saying, what's the township gonna do about the flooding? They wanted to be reimbursed for the flooding, um, you know, and, and I have, I will stay, stick to what um, more or less what Danelda had said that I, I do believe a boathouse is a boathouse. Uh, and in fact, I, I've, I've been successful in um, communicating with my customers that even perhaps you don't have a two piece boat uh, washroom facility uh, down at the boathouse because there was during floods and things, it was those plumbing facilities that actually came apart. The, the plumbing eased apart. I'll just say it that way. Um, and I, and there was no problem. I, I said, it, most people want to do the best thing possible. They just need to be educated. Um, I think those that have, and they want more and more and more, that's a whole different breed. Um, I, I, I believe they're, they're a minority compared to a majority, but I don't think we should change our bylaws because of the minority. Um, I think we should stick to a boathouse. Yes, a two-piece bath somewhere if you wanna do it that way, um, preferably upstairs actually, so there'd be some kind of catchment better, but, um, and, and yeah, I don't have a problem with someone having a fridge. I have a problem with a kitchen and, and there are full-on kitchens. Uh, and I have a problem filling in a boat slip because that was not what it was intended to do and, and what a boathouse is intended to do. But really, from my perspective, we're talking about people that have large frontages, large, um, large boathouses, um, and, and, a, and a, a good cash flow. Cash flow is all about this, right, these days. And so... I don't know if we're trying to um, actually squeeze the guy with the small one slip boathouse kind of thing. I, I don't know where that all fits, but we've we've been able to to uh, we changed our our bylaws in the past to allow um, putting a, a tent out on the de deck. Let's not forget that. Like there was, we put provisions in place for people to get out of the sun. It didn't have to be in the boathouse. Thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, a lot of good conversation, but I just want to remind everyone that the title of this section is called Boathouse. It's not called Recreation Area. I, I fully support everything that people have said about getting out of the sun and stuff like that, because, you know, we do it. We have our little umbrella that we put up and, the, and, and been known to get inside the boat to get out of the sun. But this has got to remain a boathouse. Like 50, give a 50 50 is a ridiculous number. Sorry to say ridiculous. 50 50 is not an appropriate number. 
because it gives recreations the same rights as boats when this is a boathouse. I'm very supportive of a lot of the comments of Councillor Kelly and Councillor Hayes and others that if we're going to do this, it's got to be very, very restrictive, um, you know, and 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 and, and underline what uh, Councillor Kelly was saying, enforcement. Now, I don't know whether this is possible, feasible or allowed, but if we permit this, then you must allow the township to gain entry at any time, probably not permitted, to validate that there are no walls and that X percentage greater than 50 is being is not covered and those, that's my opinion and i think uh, i look forward to uh, what the public will have to say on this thank you thank you councillor mazan uh, thank you and through you <clears throat> i uh generally supportive or like the creativity that the um uh, the uh, consultant has brought forward on this one it's not easy. I have two comments. First of all, I do agree on the, the percentage. I think that's pretty steep. Um, having 50% allocated to recreation. So I would ask that we, we explore is 50% the right number? My gut is that's pretty high. Uh, and, and these are supposed to be boat houses. The slips are supposed to be there for boats. Um, so I think that's an important number and would ask, uh, well, no, I look forward to hearing what the public has to say. Um, like generally speaking, some of these docks are fairly large. So I think you could have a larger living space, not to say a living room on the main floor, than we even permit on the second floor. That brings me to my second question. And that is, um, we don't permit dwellings over the waterfront. The definition of a dwelling is my understanding is the kitchen. And the, de the difference between having a little kitchenette and a kitchen is the stove. And I just wanted clarification on that. Is that correct? Because we, we, we really do want to be careful, I think, on allowing kitchens. Is what, that that's the term I'm hearing right now on a main floor of a boathouse. I'm, I'm supportive. I think every boathouse you would go through in Muskoka, old or new, probably has, I will call it the beer fridge. Those are just been kind of an iconic part of the boathouse experience. But having a full on kitchen, I think is a really big step. So, um, and, and we don't permit them as of right today. So I guess I'm looking for clarification from staff on that. <clears throat> Mr. McDonald, would you like to comment? Yeah, I guess, you know, from, from my perspective, uh, I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Pink to provide his comments on, on, on what we envision here. But when we're thinking recreational floor area, I'm personally not thinking full on kitchens. I, I, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. There already is a kitchen in the main house. And if somebody wants to barbecue, they'll do that outside. I can certainly see, as the mayor indicated, another sink, a sitting area, um, and, 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 and perhaps even a TV. But that's what we're thinking. The challenge with all of this, and, and I think you're all aware, is that we can only go so far in, in telling someone how they can use the inside of, a, of, a, of, of any building. And, and of course, when we dictate how much floor area can be used for one thing and how much can be used for another, that's pretty easy because you can measure that. Uh, but when, you're, when you get into, well, you can't have a, a TV inside or you can't have a stove, those are very difficult things to enforce. Uh, let alone in an OP, but let not even in a zoning bylaw. So, so there will be some challenges if, no matter what we do. The issue is here is that folks are doing this already and, and, and this is happening everywhere. So there is a need for some kind of rule on this issue or else people will just continue using the bottom floor boathouses uh, in, in any manner they so choose. So I'm thinking something is better than nothing. Just throw that out there. Uh, in terms of full-on kitchens, uh, Mr. Pink, any comments as it relates to habitable floor, habitable floor space in the second story of both houses and what you can do and can? Mr. Pink. Through the chair, I guess to directly answer Councillor Mazan's question, yes, the, uh, the difference between uh, a dwelling and a sleeping cabin or a non-habitable use is, is a kitchen, which is defined as the cooking facility. I think as, um, as you can see, this is a, uh, it is a difficult issue. 
I think this, uh, to really frame it as a significant change from historical practice. We've uh, always, in planning documents in Muskoka, have considered boathouses to be for the storage of boats and marine equipment. Um, we did try, I think as Councillor Nishikawa pointed out, uh, in our last zoning bylaw update, we added a sun shelter uh, as a permitted use over the dock. There doesn't seem to be any uptake of it. And I think the reason is, is the way we set up the zoning bylaw. If you want to build a sun shelter, it's going to result in a smaller boathouse. And no one seems to be uh, willing to make that sacrifice uh, because we didn't want to allow uh, greater boathouse sizes or, or shoreline structure sizes. Um, I certainly, just so uh, councillors are aware of, of my opinion, I, I do struggle somewhat with this issue, as uh, Councillor Jagowitz pointed out. Uh, we are dealing with a very similar issue on land. We had that meeting on Friday, but I think there are some uh, distinctions here. I certainly never envisioned any kitchens. Um, I think 50% uh, is, is awfully high in my opinion. I was envisioning closer to 20, 25%. Uh, and clearly just a interior sitting type area. Uh, really, that's it. I think we're largely seeing it. And the reason I think this is a little bit different than the discussion we had on Friday is because uh, with land-based structures, uh, as, as much as the zoning bylaw can get creative and say it has to be a garage or for use of cars, uh, there's really no way to control that. But with boathouses, we can clearly stipulate that a portion, a percentage has to be open to the water. And that's at least with a boathouse easier to see from public property. The lake is a public water body. We have access to it. Most boathouse houses have large doors, large windows, and it's easier to see that there's in fact open to water. And that's clearly uh, easy to administer through building permits. So as long as there's open water, we know that the entire boathouse <coughs> won't be used uh, for living space. So what I would suggest, again, I, it's a very interesting topic. It's a good debate. And as we've seen, it's a large shift from where we've gone. But keep in mind the stage that we're at, we're giving direction to Mr. McDonald, Mr. Diamond and myself to craft policy, come back to you with the draft. Why don't you let us try to encapsulate the correct percentage, the appropriate restrictions around it. And if it comes back uh, to this planning committee and you don't like it, it's very easy to go back to the status quo, which is boathouses are for boats. Um, so don't wanna do wasted work for Mr. McDonald and, uh, and myself, but let us take a crack at it. That's the recommendation. Uh, you will be able to review those policies uh, before we go out and have a public meeting on them. Um, so just a suggestion to perhaps um, try to uh, park the boat or land the plane, so to speak. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Pink. Okay, so um, Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Chair uh, Bridgman. Uh, I agree with uh, Councillor Roberts. In fact, if you're gonna go 50%, why don't we just, just change the, the, the name to a house that accommodates boats? And that is way too much. And that uh, will let the, the public get, and that decide what it should be. But I think it should be a, a footage like 200 square feet, 225, 250, whatever it is. And that we see boathouses completely closed in and then they put a boat lift outside because the boat gets damaged by the waves. Well, then put it in the boathouse. It's as simple as that. And boathouses could be smaller if they were just taking boats. And this is the environment. I thought our strategic plan was saying environment first. So we have to make up our, our, our minds on it, but I'm going to let the, the lake associations and the residents come up with, with what it should be, but I could not support 50% or you might as well just call it a house. Thank you. So I'm going to, before I get to you, Mayor Harding, I agree 50% is far too, far too much in my way of thinking. Committee, are we going to ask Mr. McDonald, Mr. Pink, and uh, to reduce that number when they come back? I am in agreement with Mr. Pink that 20% sounds all right to me. We're talking about just getting out of the sun here, not having a party inside. So can I can I get some feedback on 20% or 25%? We have... Okay, so we're not sure. So, okay, Mayor Harding, I just thought I'd take a poll before I let you speak. Uh, thank you. The um, reason I suggested 50% is if I happen to have a two slip boathouse, typically somebody would deck in one of the two slips, which is 50%. Um, you know, if we say it has to be 50%, or let's say it has to be 25% only open, 
um, or closed, we eliminate dry boathouses. And we have dry slip boathouses that have been built around that all of a sudden would become legal non-conforming. So I think Mr. McDonald has the right language that talks about recreational use um, of this versus a dry slip, because I think that's difficult at the end of the day when we do talk about a dry slip boathouse. So again, if I had one slip, not a chance could you deck it in. If I had two slips, you know, I'm going to deck in half of my slip, that other slip becomes kind of useless. Um, three slips, theoretically, would be a one of the slips would be decked in. And I think that's where people are dealing with a reconfiguration of dock slips and everything else. So I, I think Mr. McDonald can get to the right conclusion. Um, my suggestion of the features and was a hard cap on one side, but I'm, I'm not going to follow my sword about that. If I've got a brand new sheet of paper and I'm designing a boathouse, uh, I absolutely agree that 25% would be an appropriate number uh, of maximum deck. And I like uh, Councillor Everett's comments of, you know, there's maybe a square area frontage we talk about right now, 200 square feet on shore. Maybe it's two or 300. I'll say 300. If I had a 10 by 30 foot slip, that's 300 square feet of uh, deck area. Uh, for sitting and lounging inside the boathouse. So there might be another way to deal with it that way. Okay, thank you, Councillor Savitz. Oh, there we go. Does that work? Yeah. So uh, it's funny, this is a rich man's problem we're all dealing with here. Um, you know, if you're going to have a single slip boathouse and a $200,000 boat, and if you go to buy a boat recently, that's about what you're going to between one one hundred and $250,000. So you're probably going to take care of your boat by putting it in a boathouse. It's only when you have, as the good mayor has said, two slips or more that this becomes an issue. One would think that uh, 25% uh, of, of the space in a two slip boathouse, you know, I'm fine with that. I, I in fact, I like that number. Um, I, I, I might suggest as well that, uh, you know, you need 300 feet, as we all know right now, before we get into the debate later today, uh, about, uh, you know, about properties and size and size of boathouses and things. So to, to my mind, um, you know, you're, you've got, you're sitting on a three and a half to $12 million property to have this discussion. So, uh, you know, we have a lot of those, uh, but I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing personally yet but, but it will come. And so I think we need to be anticipative of that and, and dial this in. So I think we acknowledge that there's no kitchen uh, for sure, but I think that we can talk about 25% of the space being used for recreational purposes and uh, call it a day. Thank you. Councillor Kelly. Sorry, uh, through you, uh, thank you. Real quick, I, I, I don't think we should talk about percentages because all we do when we try to split it up by a percentage is encourage somebody to build the biggest boathouse they can to maximize the recreational floor space. I think we should turn it around and say, what's the activity we wanna legitimize in there? Uh, if it's sitting and, uh, and barbecuing and having a drink, that you know that's uh, 20, 20 square feet per person or something. There's, I'd rather have a hard cap in, in square feet uh, to govern the size of this space, then dangle a percentage out there and and uh, and challenge people to try to find a way to build the biggest boathouse they could to maximize that space. Thank you. Mr. McDonald, I think you have a comment there. Yeah, I was just thinking as I was listening to this conversation that, that I can see there being a cap on the percentage, but also a cap on the actual size. So, so that someone cannot drive a truck through such a provision and build a pretty large living area. So I'm thinking it'll be two numbers and not one that we come up with to, to regulate this. I think Jim has a comment as well. I think he does, please go ahead. Thanks. Um, first of all, I'm gonna say, um, let's model it and let you know exactly what works. I've been sitting here doing a sketch and I've drawn a million boathouses in my life. I can tell you that a standard two slip boathouse, you can uh, build it in 1,280 square feet. So if you build a 1,600 square foot boathouse for some space to do other stuff, that gives you 320 square feet of doing stuff other than storing two boats. Seems like a good number and it's exactly 25%. But um, we, can, we can do some models with two slip and three slip boathouses and get back uh, when, we have, uh, when we have that done and, and respond to council's comments. 
Okay, so uh, Councillor Jaglowitz, Mazan, and Edwards, is something new you're adding here? Because I think we're going to talk about this again when it comes back. So, Councillor Jaglowitz? Yes, yes, I'm, uh, as, as you know, I might, when I first spoke, I was opposed to this. I'm, I'm being encouraged by the direction it's going, although I have a couple of suggestions. I, I agree it should be a amount of square footage, like 200 or 200, or 250 square feet, and that should include everything other than used for boat storage. So that should include the two-piece washroom too. The other caveat I have, you don't need two washrooms in a boathouse. So if it's a two-story boathouse with a washroom upstairs, it doesn't need one downstairs. So I think if uh, uh, I think if those limits were put on it, I could uh, I could uh, see that coming forward. I agree with Councillor Kelly. The percentage is wrong. That's just encourage people to build big structures over the water. That's not what we want. Thank you, Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you. It's through you. Um, just picking up. I, I agree. I think we need to come have our consultants come back with two sets of numbers for us to look at because uh, that would encourage uh, people to go bigger. Um, two other very quick uh, points. I'm not sure it's really important for this point, but uh, laundry facilities shouldn't be permitted on the main level. I think we've seen some recent applicants come forward with that thought, and I just think it needs to be stated in the same way as kitchens. And um, the uh, Second thing that uh, I've seen out there or heard about, I haven't seen personally, are the lifts that come up with docks on them that will that then close in a, a, an open space. I'm just throwing it out there. Innovation exists. Um, so as we're contemplating this, and it might be in the next stage of development, how to manage that kind of um, uh, thing from an enforcement standpoint. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll be quick. Right now, we say 50 square square feet in, in a house, with, uh, in, in a uh, boat house. So that's why I said square feet rather than uh, percentages. So I think the uh, consultants can come up with, with something that is basically uh, the, the same size as a normal living room or something like that to get out of the sun. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, so Mr. McDonald, I believe you have your direction here and you are putting on your creative juices here to, to bring this back to us. So that's great. All right, lot coverage. I believe the next one is lot coverage and area requirements for new waterfront lots. Yes, uh, it's lot frontage and area requirements for uh, new waterfront lots. And as uh, this committee is aware, uh, we've uh, increased uh, across the board the minimum lot area and uh, lot frontage required uh, for new lots on, on basically every lake uh, except Lake Joseph, which is already at a higher number. So on Lakes Muskoka and Rosso, uh, the minimum lot area is proposed to increase from 0.4 hectares and the frontage is going to go from 60 to uh, 90 meters. So it'll be 8.8 hectares and 90. On the 28 category two lakes, the minimum lot area and frontage is also going up from 0.4 to 0.8 and from 60 to 90. And then on the remaining uh, category three lakes, the minimum lot frontage will be 0.8 hectares and 120 meters. We've also made changes in terms of the minimum lot area and waterfront required on lots where steep slopes are present on narrow water bodies. And of course, uh, as already discussed, uh, if a water access only lot is proposed, uh, in response to a question about whether this made sense or not. In the survey, 71% said yes and 29% no. Uh, certainly requiring larger lots uh, further limits the number of new lots that can be created. We've already heard that. That's, that's a clear outcome of this kind of policy. It certainly limits the number of new septic systems on the large and medium-sized lakes that can be developed, uh, protects the tree character of the remaining, remaining undeveloped area and the underdeveloped shoreline areas. So in looking at this and thinking about this, I think it's entirely appropriate for uh, the township to move in this direction for the reasons noted. Uh, so my recommendation is to maintain the course and continue and include these uh, revised law frontages and areas in the next draft of the official plan. Okay, thank you. Mayor Harding. Um, thank you. And uh, I know the public has generally said yes to this um, regarding increases. I, I want to just put it out there for committee's perspective. 
the bigger lots we have, the more financial and the bigger the vet, the investment is in anybody who's buying into Muskoka. If we have seen the most egregious of uh, irresponsible development, it would probably be on Lake Joseph, which already has the biggest development of lots at 300 feet. The more money it takes for me to buy a lot, the more development I'm probably going to do around the lot. I, I didn't chime in on our last discussion about um, we're just encouraging people to big, build bigger boathouses. The reality is I have never seen an application where they don't maximize the size of the boathouse. If I have 300 feet, I built 75 feet of dock and I'm building my 18% of boathouse width. We always recognize and Councillor Edwards would confirm a committee of adjustment. Generally speaking, we're going from 10 to somewhere to 11% of lot coverage to be able to maximize the buildings on our properties. And people are trying to redevelop within the confines that they have currently. So um, we don't have really have policies to incentivize smaller boathouses. Um, they're always building the biggest boathouses, the biggest cottages. And I just, I, I question that there'd be an unintended consequence of creating larger lots. And as soon as you hit 300 feet, it means every boat, every cottage is entitled a two-story boathouse. So as we move forward, we're going to expect more two-story boathouses, more development on the water. We're not pushing people back and putting bunky cottages on land because of as of right, I can now build a two-story boathouse. So I, I raise this question because we also at times, I think, make Muskoka unaffordable. And I've said this before that my best neighbors are the people who are scraping by to pay their taxes. The people who don't have big boathouses, who have small hundred foot lots, they're the most respectful. Um, it's sometimes the new, I wanna be in Muskoka and I wanna show off what I have, that people are not as respectful as we would like. So that's my high level that do we wanna go down this 300 foot uh, line and there might be some significant unintended consequences uh, moving so. Okay, Councillor Hayes. Uh, thank you, through you. I just have a couple of points. Just on Lake Muskoka, where we're talking about increasing it from 300 to 400, um, if I could ask uh, staff, what are the requirements for Bracebridge and Gravenhurst? Because we share the lake with them and, you know, we should be have some kind of compliance going forward so that um, development is mirrored within the three areas that occupy the lake. And do we know yet how many lots we have that are over 600 feet because we're looking at changing it from 300 feet. So a severance would be 600. So do we know how many? And another issue would be how many of those are on the mainland and how many are islands that could be developed because islands require um, a little bit different handling than on the mainland. So I, I would like that number before we proceed with changing Muskoka Lakes because it, it does affect what people have planned to do um, generationally with their property. So thank you for that. Um, was that a question somewhere, Councillor Hayes? I don't, I, I think Mr. Pink wants to answer. Yeah, I think that the two questions were how many do we have? which are island, which are mainland, and what do Gravenhurst and Bracebridge require for severances on Muskoka Lakes? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, what I can say is the Muskoka official plan has a 200 foot, one acre minimum. So I believe Bracebridge and Gravenhurst would still allow uh, lots at uh, those dimensions, at those minimum dimensions as we currently do. Uh, I don't want to guess. I would have to research uh, more specifically. It's likely both Bracebridge and Gravenhurst have increased requirements as we do, depending on any natural or topographical uh, constraints. Uh, but we can certainly look into that. Uh, in regards to, uh, we can certainly do um, uh, GIS exercise, a query on how many uh, 600 foot lots remain. Keep in mind our limitations are, it would be based off assessment information. 
And as you know, um, not 100% accurate, number one. And number two, uh, the way we measure frontage uh, and the way you necessarily would lay out a property doesn't always line up neatly with an assessed frontage. Uh, but if committee wishes, uh, we can certainly do that uh, exercise um, to see how many um, properties remain in Muskoka uh, or on the big three lakes, medium lakes. I'd like some parameters. Uh, the other thing you, you do need to consider is you may have a 600 foot property uh, with a very large recent uh, dwelling in the smack dab in the middle of it uh, and a two-story boathouse in the middle of it. So we can run those numbers. And I think uh, Mr. Clark noted that, that uh, we don't necessarily have that information. The difficulty is uh, we can do those basic query searches based off assessment information, but it's sometimes going to paint a misleading picture. Um, it would take extensive amount of time to um, literally look into every individual property to really research properly whether it has subdivision rights currently and would have subdivision rights uh, under the current proposal. There's no question the proposal before you is to, uh, you know, would significantly reduce the number of lots, potential lots out there uh, by adding the 100 feet, uh, but it would be quite the exercise to give you an accurate number of, you know, properties that that would impact. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm supportive of this recommendation, but I have a question. I, I, and it may be just my lack of seeing it. I don't see where islands have been dealt with uh, separately from, uh, from mainland properties. And why I raise it is that uh, islands less than 0.8 hectare maybe should be dealt with differently and islands larger than that have a problem because they have very large frontages and um, it, it, it and they have, are usually very shallow lots, so they they generally come up and have subdivision rights, and that allows much more development. So I just wondered if if there was a recommendation for island lots, and whether I missed it or whether you're thinking about it. Mr. McDonald, yeah, section uh, E four point four point four requires a one hectare minimum lot area for water access only lots. And I believe that's an increase uh, over the 0.8 hectares that's currently there. So there, there is an increase there too. Um, as, as Mr. Pink will indicate, because he's indicated this to me on a couple of occasions, with islands, the minimum lot area ends up being the most important requirement than the actual frontage. Um, and that, that, is, that becomes the determining factor on whether it's actually possible to create lots on islands. Uh, if Mr. Pick wants to further comment on that, please do. Mr. Pink. Just very quickly, thank you uh, through you, the chair. Uh, currently, island properties already have an increased requirement. They're currently at 300 feet and two acres. And as Mr. McDonald noted, we're suggesting a, a slight increase to the lot area. And as he noted, it's typically the lot area that's your determining factor on uh, lot creation of island properties. Typically the frontage is, is there. It's the acreage that limits the number of lots that can be created. So uh, increasing that from 0.8 to one hectare uh, would have more of an impact than uh, likely increasing the, the frontage would. So quick supplementary. So I missed it because it wasn't in the summary, but it is in the detail. Thank you very much. Okay, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. Um, I would be in support of um, David, what David had just mentioned about the islands. I think it is uh, often, I think we created two small lots, not necessarily the, the frontage, but the, the lot overall um, as well, though that I, I'm happy with 300 feet of frontage. I don't want to see movement there. I don't know what, again, what we're, our overall vision of what we're trying to do, other than limit that many more people that should come to Muskoka, I guess. Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. I, I wanna back up to my question and comment about unintended consequences about creating bigger lots and creating more development on our lake. And maybe Mr. Pink or Mr. Sharp even can help answer this question. When people come in for a planning exercise and they've got a 200 foot lot or a 300 foot lot, are they planning a 5% lot development that we've seen in the past? Or are they planning a 10 to an 11% lot coverage? Are they maxing out the development rights that are within the lots? Um, 
And the point being that if we are creating bigger lots, we are creating potentially bigger development on said lots, which could compound our problem with an unintended consequence. So I'm not sure who wants to answer that. Mr. Pink. Thank you, uh, through you. Obviously I, I can't generalize and speak for you know, every property owner and their plans, but certainly there is a, a demand, a pressure to build uh, larger in Muskoka. And, and I get uh, the concern, and that's certainly something committee needs to consider that uh, essentially every new lot will have um, the rights for a two-story vote house. But what I would say, yes, it, typically larger lots do have larger developments. Um, I wouldn't dispute that, but I find um, with that said, larger properties still retain much more natural area, uh, much more forested area, much more natural area. I typically have more concerns with very small properties because the septic system, the driveway, the parking area, access to the waterfront, those are all finite and set. And when you have a, a very small property of less than an acre, um, there's tends to be much less natural area remaining on that property uh, than a two, three, four, five acre per property. Yes, it may have a large cottage and a large two-story boathouse, but there's still natural frontage along the shoreline and there's still natural forested areas where you won't typically see that on a uh, half acre property uh, because all those uh, standard sort of requirements of developing a waterfront property uh, are set. So um, hopefully that helps uh, frame it somewhat. Okay, so I, I am... Um... Often my opinion has been expressed by everybody else, so I know I don't chime in very often, but I, I thinking about Mayor Harding talking about going to 300 feet and you've got two boathouses. Well, if you stay at 200 feet, you've got three properties, I think to, to Director, Point, Director Pink's point, you now have three properties with the possibility of three boathouses uh, instead of two boathouses. And again, three cottages instead of two. So I I honestly don't think there's an un intended consequence um, out of that. And I think the other thing I want to point out for anybody listening in, all of the properties that are already developed, the 200 foot ones, the 100, they all resell at whatever size they are. So we're only talking about new development here and new, new properties. We aren't talking about the majority of the properties in Muskoka. So I did, I, did, I do want to point that, that out to everybody. And as we see happen when we do these changes, people that have less than 600 feet who want to subdivide will have the opportunity to do that. It may, it may not fit into their current plans, but they do, have a, they do have a time window to be able to do those subdivisions if they really want to do it. So I am in complete support of this. All right, so um, I know we've had some discussion here. Can I get a straw vote? Are we going forward with what's been recommended here? Uh, Councillor Edwards, before I go there. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I uh, agree with this. Let's see what the uh, people do. But I would ask the consultants again, as I'd asked them originally, put in the imperial measurements as well. Yes, I know that 0.8 is two acres, and I know what one is two and a half, but there's a lot of people that are still thinking the old way. And it would be nice that, that they didn't have to do all the conversions. Thank you. Is that in your program, Mr. McDonald? Like, can you just do an automatic conversion in the program? Um, not, not necessarily, but what I did do in this last draft is I did uh, do exactly what Councillor Edwards asked. So in the actual official plan, we do have the Imperial everywhere. I just didn't do it in this memorandum, so I apologize for that. Okay, so do we have general agreement on this moving forward as is? Can I see maybe a show of hands? I know, Count, I know, Mayor Harding, you want to say something? Um, so I, I'm agreeing. I'm happy to move this forward at this particular time, just so people understand. Um, Councillor Hayes had sort of looked at asking staff to do some quick measurements on how many 600 foot lots there are. Um, I think the other thing that would be interesting is in the past number of years, how many 200 foot lots have been created? Um, because I do believe that most people, even though they have slightly larger, maybe they have 500 feet, they create two 250s. Um, they don't necessarily, or they had 600, they do one 300. I don't know what they develop. And I think that's sort of uh, interesting to see whether they're actually developing to 200 feet. 
I know whenever we've contemplated someone who's dividing up their property, we always push them for bigger lots, <clears throat> not smaller at the best of times. So they never really follow the bylaw. Uh, they're always exceeding it for the most part, I believe. So it'd be interesting just to have that data as we move forward to a public meeting with the next draft. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have General uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, yeah, just a quick comment. I guess I have a different experience when lots are created. Generally, they go to Committee of Adjustment and try to create the lot smaller. But anyway, so uh, I don't think that information is necessary. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Pink, do you, uh, Councillor Nishikawa? All right. Thank you. Sorry, um, my question is to you. I, I, I'm not. I'm not sure what we're giving our thumbs up for. I've heard lots of different thoughts and and ideas, and I'm just to say, are we all in agreement with the policy written? Well, I don't think that we are, because um, I've heard from four different speakers that said different things, and so I'm I'm concerned about what we're asking to be moved forward very clearly what we're being asked to move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we have had different comments. So what I am asking is as written, increasing the lot size on all of this, are we, do we have a majority? Because that's the way we're gonna have to go here um, that uh, want this to move forward for public opinion, the way it's written. So can I have a straw vote on that? Two, three, four, five, six. Can you just come? Uh, Councilor Mazan, is your hand up? It's hard to see. You're a little blurry. One, two, three, four, <laughs> okay, we're good. We're good. five, six. I think we've got six, we're good. We're good. right? Yeah. So it's going to go out to the public, and we'll see what we'll see what comes back from the public on this. Okay, Mr. McDonald, I think we can move on to the next. Great, so we're going to move into recommendation four. This deals with causation studies. It's, it's fairly straightforward. Uh, currently, as set out in the, memor in the memorandum, uh, causation studies are required for a number of lakes uh, in the township and the district is the, the body responsible for carrying out these causation studies. Uh, these studies are intended to investigate uh, cause and effect relationships and is triggered when one or more water quality indicators is confirmed to be uh, confirmed to be present. Um, what we did in the official plan, and this was discussed through the policy direction phase, uh, was to include a policy that uh, indicated that new lots would not be permitted to be created on any of these lakes until the causation study was uh, completed. And certainly, if the causation study uh, determined that the cause of the issue uh, had to do with development. Uh, directly, um, then of course that uh, prohibition on lock creation would most likely remain uh, as a consequence of that. If it went the other way and it was determined it was something else, uh, then then of course the uh, potential would exist for lock creation to be permitted in the future. Um, causation studies are challenging to 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 prepare, and as indicated, they may not be conclusive, and that will be a challenge. This is a new policy approach. At the, at the district level. It'll take some time to see how this will all work out. Uh, but as uh, part of the overall precautionary principle that we're applying in this plan, uh, we thought, and I continue to believe uh, that restricting law creation on these lakes until the studies are at least done uh, continues to be appropriate. And that is my recommendation to this committee. Okay, thank you. Any comments committee? Councillor Hayes. It, just one comment, and that is um, causation studies triggered by water quality, I think is a good thing, and I would support that. However, I believe we were told that the district did not know how long it was going to take to do the causation studies for those lakes. Um, so I, I don't mind waiting a reasonable amount of time. But when a causation study may not be in the books for four or five years, I mean, do we have any idea what the time frame would be for that? Um, I, I just didn't want to 
I like the idea, but I'm torn on this particular one. Mr. McDonald. Yeah, in response, I know the district uh, through their budgeting process looks at how many causation studies they can complete in a year. Uh, there are, are a number of things they consider. Uh, budget is obviously one of them. Um, time and resources and so on are issues for them as well. I'm aware that they, uh, uh, I guess in the last little while, did a report and, and recommended that a number of causation studies be completed, but I've lost track of, of the timing of all of them. Um, but your point is well taken. Um, it's really up to the district to make these decisions and for local municipalities to, to, to lobby the district to, to get as many of these things done as, as possible in any given year. Um, but it seems that it will take some time for some of the lakes to be dealt with. And, you know, I, I don't know if, if we should be changing our approach based on that only. Uh, perhaps that could be considered later, but I'm not sure that's the approach to take now. Uh, Mr. Pink, any additional comments on in terms of timing of these causation studies that I may have missed? Mr. Pink. Uh, thank you uh, through the chair. Uh, similarly to yourself, I've lost a little bit of track. I know the district ran into some uh, issues. They tried to complete a number of studies uh, over the last year or two, and they run into timing uh, Etc. issues, but I believe a few are underway um, and they continue to devote uh, resources to continue to complete those outstanding, but it will take some time as Mr. McDonald said, stated. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you. If my memory serves me correct, causation, uh, causation studies does not assess the quality of water. It only assesses the the the, the, the cause of blue uh, of, of algae blooms green blue green algae there are numerous other water uh, health healthy water uh, lake uh, measurements that are not cannot are not being looked into so um, you know to think that we're looking at that this is going to handle our water take a look at our water quality it's not so enough on that um, what I'd like to add to the recommendation, is not only completion of the, and what was mentioned earlier by one of the delegates, not only the completion of the causation study, but implementation of the recommendations of the causation study. So uh, would uh, committee consider that? Okay, I noted that to when we get to our discussion, we'll bring that back, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Kelly? Thank you, and through you, just a real quick question. Uh, I understand uh, specifically to the two on Lake Muskoka, Boyd Bay and Wise Miller Bay. I understand how you can isolate two bays for purposes of uh, causation studies for doing the work to do the study, but do we actually have uh, the ability to prohibit activities around or on a specific bay? And, and how does it relate, for instance, to properties that might be partially on a bay? not on a bank, it just sounds to me like um, a scramble that I'm, I, I'm curious to know how we, how we would deal with it. I'm gonna let Director Pink hop in here, Director Pink. Thank you, um, Mr. McDonald may wish to add, but the, uh, we would look to the District of Muskoka. Uh, they model the uh, Lake System Health Program and the Water Quality Model, and they do actually define those boundaries of those bays and lakes, and we would look to them, and there, at the end of the day, does have to be a finite line, uh, but they do uh, provide those boundaries for us. Uh, just to uh, Councillor Roberts' last comment, uh, this may help clarify. Uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, Councillor Roberts is exactly correct. It's not a water quality study per se. It's a determination of the root cause of why the lake may be experiencing one of those indicators. But I do not, I'm not sure if we need to um, sort of add any uh, restrictions or reference implementation. The way the policies are set up is if that causation study determines that development is the cause of uh, those water quality issues. The hold would remain, the prohibition on lock coverage would remain. So there's no real reason to implement anything different for uh, an implementation. Essentially the, the pause that we would temporarily have would become permanent because we would know the root cause is development. If it's inconclusive, if it's natural, if it's due to agriculture, uh, sediments, then 
clearly development is not causing it and the hold would be lifted. So just want everyone to be clear on how the policy is structured and, and what the intent is. And to supplement what uh, Mr. Pink just said, uh, if it's determined that development is the cause, other uh, things may be needed, may need to change as well, such as increasing the setback from the lake, uh, reducing dwelling unit size, uh, changing boathouse permissions. There could be a whole range of things that come out of that, uh, in addition to a, uh, a longer term full-time prohibition on law creation. So many outcomes are possible, but uh, Mr. Pink is correct that if development is shown to be the cause, then that prohibition would stay. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you, I, I'm a little bit challenged as to um, who is going to be responsible and who's going to pick up the costs um, are we just applying to the district to say we need this area have a causation study and and I, I I'm really trying to understand what a property owner is going to be um, asked to pay for along with the other and and again um, it's interesting because Councillor Zavix went through the exercise for habitat to find out all of the different costs and things like that that are associated with development. Um, and I, I believe that that, that's, that should be shown up to the public all the time because all of these costs are, are just adding up. And I'm just very cautious about um, having an understanding of who's gonna pick it up and who's the timing. And again, um, I, I look at, Wise Miller Bay, for instance, and I think about, we have a recreational use dock in that area, as in our township has a facility that brings all sorts of people and all sorts of different activity to the area that we've known has had some struggles. So I'm not even sure how that comes into play. Um, anyhow, I don't know who can answer me, but I, I just am curious of who's gonna pick up the tab. Mr. McDonald. Yeah, all of the great questions. So it's my understanding that the district fully funds the preparation of causation studies and it comes out of their budget with obviously taxpayers fund. Uh, so there is no levies or, or charges being uh, you know, levied onto individual property owners around, around the lake. Um, and because the district is the one who makes the decisions on which one should be prepared or this year and which one should be done next year, it's really up to them to make those decisions. We did include a policy in, in the draft official plan that basically says if the district is not prepared or doesn't have the resources to do a causation study, the township can initiate such a causation study as well and could partner with a lake association to do that. So that opportunity is there. Um, if the district is unwilling or unable to prepare a causation study on their own. So that's always available to the township. And if the township did that, then again, that would be funded through the budget. I don't anticipate there being any levies placed on individual property owners. It would be a township expense, uh, just like it would be to do any other kind of study like the transportation master plan that you're undertaking right now. Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm not seeing any more input and I believe Councillor Roberts, you had your question answered. All right, so can I get a thumbs up on this going out to the public as recommended? Agreement, Mr. McDonald, there you go. And uh, we can now move on to your next one. Great, so the next one deals with site plan approval. And as uh, this committee knows, we've expanded the uh, number of uh, instances in which, uh, for which site plan approval will be required. It, they're listed uh, in, the, in, in the memorandum. So site plan approval will be required for all new dwellings, um, additions to existing dwellings and buildings to propose an increase in the ground floor area of more than 50 square meters. So roughly 500 square feet, just to be clear the relocation of an existing dwelling to another location on the lot, uh, new sleeping cabins, uh, new boathouses and expansions to existing boathouses that involve an increase in floor area of more than 50 square meters or the addition 
of a sleeping cabin in the second story and new accessory buildings that exceed 50 square meters of floor area. In one of the delegations earlier today, uh, someone indicated that we were would be requiring site plan approval for docks. That's not uh, in the cards. That's not in the official plan, and we're not proposing uh, to do that. Um, now, that's that that will mean, of course, as has already been indicated, that there will be more site plan applications and more resources required at the township uh, to deal uh, with these applications. Uh, it is my opinion that going through a site plan process allows for there to be a site specific conversation with each of these applicants to get the best uh, outcome on each property. And it also allows the municipality to enter into an agreement with the uh, property owner to ensure that certain things are done a certain way and also to secure securities um, so that uh, everything is done uh, in accordance with uh, the plans that have been approved before the securities uh, are uh, given back. And lastly, of course, there is uh, there is uh, the ability to also include monitoring within site plan agreements as well that allows the township to come in and look at how someone has performed in accordance with that agreement uh, going forward. So in terms of the survey question that was asked, uh, folks were asked whether this was a good idea or not. About 70% or just under 70% said yes and 31% no uh, said no. I continue to believe that site plan approval is an appropriate tool. Uh, yes, it does add time to the planning process, uh, but in my opinion, it results in better outcomes. I do recognize as well, however, that resources will need to be, the resourcing issue will need to be addressed going forward. And I know that Mr. Pink has made that point on numerous occasions, so I don't need to make it for him, uh, but we certainly recognize that going forward. So we're not, so we're recommending that we stay the course in terms of what the official plan is doing right now in terms of what uh, site plan approval is being required for. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. I believe the district, is the district not now endorsing or the PPS endorsing that site plan approval is on every property? Yes, I should, I should mention that as well. It was also mentioned earlier that is already in the district official plan. So we would be conforming with the district plan and requiring it. Um, so we do have choices in terms of, you know, what the thresholds are, but in terms of requiring site plan approval, that is something we need to do in any event, uh, according to the district plan. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. I, I wonder whether or not there's one other criteria that needs to be added to this. And I think about, you know, new accessory buildings exceeding, you know, 500 square feet, 50 square meters. If I'm building a, a, an accessory building, a garage on the back part of my lot, it really isn't affecting the waterfront quality. And I wonder whether or not there needs to be a criteria that says in the front 30 meters, any of these adjustments are trigger a site plan. But if it's beyond 30 meters, then it may not trigger site plan. And that's what I'm kind of wondering, because um, a lot of people do have larger lots. And, you know, as I, I just built a garage, it's on the back side of my hill, no water actually heads towards, but I would have been uh, required to go through site plan um, and would have had no effect or change on the water quality. Okay, Mr. Diamond. Thanks, I just wanted to mention um, people are concerned about the application of site plan control um, because of time and cost and detail and things like that. But a lot of that can be addressed in how the site plan approval process operates within the municipality. And I understand that you've delegated a lot of that, that process to staff now. Um, so that's very helpful and can reduce the, significantly reduce the amount of time that it takes to process the applications. Very simple things can be um, dealt with very quickly, um, but you still end up with the level of control that you need and the ability to have an agreement. So I'll, I'll be quiet after that, but I, it doesn't need to be for simple things that people seem to be complaining about. It doesn't need to be a complicated process. Okay, thank you. I think our challenge is the number of applications that have gone up over the last couple of years. Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I think that site plan uh, control should be on all waterfront properties. I think when you start exempting them for one reason or the other, it gets very confusing to the public. It's very, it's, let's keep it simple. Let's keep the process as streamlined as possible. If it's just a garage in the back of the property, it should get through quickly. It, it also gives the uh, 
staff an opportunity to take a look at that property. And maybe there are other things on that property that need to be addressed at the same time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you, and just a comment. Um, uh, I heard the, the concern loud and clear for 18 months about uh, site plan uh, approval on 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 the property waterfront properties and the impact that it's going to be on township staff and the turnaround time. So the comment is, and is that I look very forward to this year's preliminary <laughs> budget discussions where staff will come back and say, given given the the numbers for 2022. Um, and, and and given that maybe in 20, sometime in 2023 we're going to have this implement or, or, or approved possibly that this is the impact that uh, of staff and the, the additional resources needed to accommodate that load. So it's just a comment to um, to planning for their next go go around on the budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Hayes. Oh, thank you. Through you, you talked about the the number of site plans, uh, the cost to the uh, resident, the fact that there'll be more staff time involved, and it will take longer to have everything uh, passed. You also have to look at um, the inspections and enforcement because that's going to add a draw on to staff as well. Yeah, it will be a natural consequence of uh, if this policy being put in place. I understand that. So, uh, Councillor Missan, are you trying to raise your hand? <laughs> it, just, it, it never comes up when you want it to, does it? Yeah, well, no, thank you. And through you, I was going to, and then I wasn't, I was mindful. Of, uh, am I repeating a comment? I think the question at hand is, is, is are we supportive of the site concept of site plans control happening on all the development? If the answer is yes, how we implement that, how we manage it is for a future discussion. But if we agree that it's the right approach or direction, I think that's where we should be headed. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Mazan's wonderful description of that. Are we in support of moving this out to the public as it stands? Okay, we have we we have that, Mr. McDonald. So that's great. So I think we're on a maximum amenity area coverage i think yes we are so that's uh, that's the item f in the uh, memorandum so at the present time the township's official plan establishes lot coverage maximums which we're going to be carrying forward into the new official plan and of course along with that is the one tenth uh, permission for exceedances and that's not proposed to change either uh, we spent quite a bit of time through the process discussing whether we should be adding amenity area coverages as well. And in, uh, with that in mind, we uh, propose to establish uh, amenity area coverage maximums with these maximums expressed as a percentage of the lot area. And we included a table within the official plan, which is reproduced uh, on in this amended, sorry, in the memorandum. And of course, amenity areas include sun decks, patios, fire pit areas, sport courts, pools, hot tubs, and similar features that don't contain a roof. Um, but they wouldn't; it wouldn't include driveways, septic systems, pathways, and stairs because those are necessary elements of every lot. With everything else, you have choices to make. Do you really need a, a sun deck? Do you want a sun deck? Where should it go? And so on. But everyone needs a driveway, and everyone needs a septic system. Um, we asked uh, in the survey. Uh, whether uh, the amenity area caps were supported, about 63% said yes, 37% uh, said no. Uh, many folks indicated that they thought some type of control uh, was necessary. Uh, others felt that this was another example of overreach. Uh, I think overreach was the term used quite often in many of the answers uh, to the questions in the survey. Um, other respondents felt the type of restriction favors the owners of larger lots and it will be hard to enforce. We also asked uh, in survey question nine, whether it was appropriate to permit small patios, fire pit areas and small amenity areas in the required 20 meter setback from the lake. And in response, 80% uh, said yes, 20% uh, uh, said no. And of course, many indicated uh, that, you know, it's the area within this distance of the lake 
where these types of amenities are the most desirable. I, I can't help but agree with that. Um, clearly, this is a significant change uh, if it was implemented uh, in the official plan and then through the zoning bylaw. And I anticipate that if we went down this road, there would be a significant increase in the number of minor variances uh, requested uh, going forward. In thinking about it further, however, I'm not sure that including amenity area caps in the official plan and then in the zoning bylaw is the best way to go, primarily because amenity areas are very difficult to measure uh, in all cases. When you're dealing with buildings and structures and foundations and roofs and so on, uh, very easy to measure, very easy to determine compliance. Uh, but when you start getting into outdoor patios, when does the patio turn into a driveway? When is a driveway not a patio? When is a sun deck uh, something else? And so on and so on. It becomes very challenging in my view. And I'm concerned uh, that we may be setting up something in the official plan and zoning bylaw uh, that is very difficult, if not impossible to enforce. And this is primarily because zoning bylaws are intended to be black and white. They're intended to be yes, no. Yes, you can do something. No, you can't. And it has to be easily understood and implementable. So my thinking is that there is merit in considering an amenity area cap of some kind, but the best place to house that rule or standard is in your site alteration bylaw, uh, because, the, because doing so allows for some discretion in the decision-making process and through the permitting process that is required under that bylaw. I understand you're having all kinds of other discussions on the site alteration bylaw, and I think this is the best place uh, for those discussions to be held. So my recommendation is that the official plan not include an amenity area covered, uh, uh, coverage cap. So in other words, I'm suggesting we take some numbers out of the draft official plan and that the official plan direct instead that the site alteration bylaw deal with this issue. Um, it's not like we're pushing this down the road. We are in a way. I really do think the site alteration bylaw is the best place to deal with something this detailed, this complex and, and, and complicated. And it also allows for more, um, as I mentioned, discretion in the decision uh, making process. I don't know if Mr. Pink wants to augment um, what I just went through because I'm not involved in the site alteration bylaw review underway. And if he has any additional comments, so now would be the time. Mr. Pink. Thank you. Uh, no, I think I, I look to the committee discussion, but I wonder, Mr. McDonald, if it's worthwhile to uh, really might be uh, frame the discussion better if we discuss the next uh, recommendation or the next matter as well, because they're very interrelated. And I think it'd be better to see the full picture and then we can discuss both matters uh, together. Just a suggestion to the to the chair and Mr. McDonald. No, that's a, that's a good point. Um, so the next section deals with site alteration. And so there was, and there has been quite a bit of discussion on site alteration as well, in terms of whether this is something the official plan should deal with um, and then uh, require implementation through uh, the zoning bylaw. So we said in the draft official plan uh, that the site alteration bylaw required that no less than 75% of any lot in the waterfront area uh, be left in an unaltered state, meaning that up to 25% could be altered. Um, the 25% cap would be would take into account the maximum lot coverage, which is up to 10%, uh, in some cases, but less on smaller lakes, um, and would allow, and, and of course, include the min minimum, sorry, the maximum amenity area coverages I just went through, plus any areas required for driveways, septic systems, and walkways. So we asked the question in the survey about this as well. 60% said it was a good idea. 40% said it was the opposite. Uh, those in favor uh, believe that uh, there, are, there is a need for more controls to control over development, protect the character and environment of the waterfront area. Uh, those opposed had concerns about the implications of this new standard on the ability to use waterfront properties and the challenges inherent in enforcing such a standard. Some folks also thought the question and the proposal only affected the first 60 meters adjacent to the shoreline. It did not, it would have affected the entire uh, lot. I continue to believe, as I mentioned earlier, that there is a need to control the amount of a property that can be altered. 
Um, however, I also recognize that there are many different contexts um, and many different types of properties. Some properties have significant rock outcrops, others don't. Uh, some have significant slopes, others don't. Um, and context is very important and it makes it very challenging to come up with a number that works in every circumstance and enshrining numbers in an official plan uh, that can be difficult to implement uh, on, in the first hand and then secondly, uh, perhaps dependent on a, a number of site specific context issues to determine whether it's the right number or not is problematic. Uh, so I continue to believe um, as, uh, as I said earlier that this is a good thing to regulate and control, uh, but it is something that should solely be dealt with in your site alteration bylaw again. So what I'm suggesting is that the site alteration bylaw deal with what the site alteration cap should be. Um, and it may uh, actually be, uh, there may actually be a need to create a sliding scale so that the numbers are different if you have a smaller lot than it would be for a bigger lot. Because 25% of a big lot allowing to be altered is a big number and that may not be appropriate. And in addition to that, I'm recommending that your site alteration bylaw also uh, include an amenity area cap as well, and that both those things are dealt in one bylaw uh, and dealt with at the same time. Therefore, therefore leaving the lot coverage to the zoning bylaw, but everything else to the site alteration bylaw. So those are my recommendations. Okay, thank you, Mr. McDonald. I just have a quick question. I don't see anybody else here. I. Having sat through some um, what was the what was LPAT um, discussions, my concern would be if we don't reference this somewhere in our official plan, that it isn't going to have as much impact when we get to the next level of government. If we doesn't really look at our bylaws, as far as I can, as far as I can discern from sitting through these discussions, so that's my concern. I understand where you're coming from, but. If we don't reference this in our official plan, are we not going to be blocked because we haven't put it in our official plan? So, so the simple answer is no, and I'm not suggesting we be silent on it. I, I'm suggesting that the official plan require that the site alteration bylaw do certain things and we can indicate very clearly why those are good uh, things to do and why it's in the public interest to do it. What I'm, uh, what I'm basically saying is we should not put numbers in the official plan. Um, on these issues, but I, I'm more than happy to to create as much language as is necessary to support the need to have these numbers in the site alteration bylaw. You don't need any official plan uh, policy to uh, to prepare a site alteration bylaw. It's independent. It's not a bylaw under the Planning Act. It's a bylaw under the Municipal Act. So it's a different piece of legislation to start off with. But certainly, to your point, um, uh, Madam Chair, it's good to have some 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 uh, uh, some clear direction in the official plan to help with those further future discussions. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, Chair uh, Bishman. Uh, further to what you said, if there is some reference in the official plan, is it not better because uh, we change bylaws all, all of the time, we amend them, and it's very, very simple to uh, do. And that uh, a previous council comes up with a bylaw, and then uh, somebody comes up and we change them. And that, so if there's some sort of a reference that makes it a little, uh, 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 lay it out a little bit better in the official plan, I would support that. But I'll, I'll leave it to Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Councillor Hayes. Thank you, through you. Uh, recommendation number six says. Um, that you would remove the, the cap and instead it would go to the site alteration bylaw. Uh, we have not finished working on our site alteration bylaw. So what happens if we decide that we're not going to have a cap? Um, it's just your recommendation and it's gone forward and now it's gone. Mr. McDonald? Well, that's a good question, and that's why I, I, I invited Mr. Pink to provide his uh, thoughts on, on the site alteration bylaw process because I'm not involved in it. I, I guess my personal opinion or my planning opinion and recommendation is that your site alteration bylaw do include an amenity area cap, and that's what I'm recommending. If council decides through the site alteration discussion that that's not going to happen, well, that's a decision the council makes, and that's up to you to, to make it. 
Um, if if uh, this committee tells me that that's not the direction the township wishes to go, then then the policy should clearly change to 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 dovetail with that direction. Yes, Mr. Pick. Thank you, Chair. Through you, uh, keep in mind the current update to the tree preservation and site alteration bylaw. We're, we're directed by council and really more uh, technical changes uh, encompassing all of islands, increasing the area that the bylaws are subject to from two to 300 feet. Uh, we're actually in some respects more permissive. We're saying you can have a patio. Uh, we are recognizing driveways now. So it's, it's more technical nature. I think I've stated on a number of occasions that really the more substantial changes to those bylaws will result, uh, will come as a result of this process. So if we wrap up the current review, it's largely again, technical changes, getting short form wording in the bylaws so that bylaw officers can issue tickets, um, those types of changes. If this official plan discussion and eventually official plan is adopted and approved and directs that there's amenity area limitations and a site alteration cap on waterfront properties and directs that those be implemented through the site alteration bylaw staff will return with a further update to the site alteration bylaw with what I would characterize as more substantial or significant changes where you'll actually will result in less alteration along our shorelines than the current update, which is more of a, uh, frankly, a, a technical exercise. I'm happy to answer any further questions if there's still a, a lack of clarity there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Jackowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm on the side that thinks that our official plan should at least talk about it. I'm not sure how, but but I have a bigger problem that I'd like to kind of raise, and it's in the form of a question. I know we have uh, rules that deal with roofed structures, and we have now talking about amenities and things that are non-roofed. But then we've got this animal called a storage building that, if my recollection is correct, uh, it, it, it comes into lot coverage in the first 200 feet or whatever, but beyond that, I don't believe it, 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 it comes into lot coverage. So I just like a clarification as to which category a storage building, which as we found out last week, a storage building is a building that's not a habitable building. So it, it's everything else and not a garage, not a boathouse. So I just wondered if that's caught in the coverage there or whether it should be dealt with here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Pink. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I'm not sure where um, I guess that confusion arose from the public, um, but I believe I, I thought I answered it on Friday and I'll answer it again. The zoning bylaw currently does regulate all roof buildings within 200 feet and also regulates all roof buildings beyond 200 feet as well. It's just that typically if you have a very large 10 plus acre property with a lot of depth beyond 200 feet that's potentially a large coverage but the zoning bylaw has always limited um, to 10 percent of the area within 200 feet and then all buildings to 10 percent of the entire lot so whether it's uh, uh, I think the issue at hand or the way to frame this discussion in my mind is it doesn't matter what the building is used for boathouse storage cottage sleeping cabin gazebo our official plan and our zoning bylaw has historically been very prescriptive, very detailed, very restrictive on lot coverage. We have gone, I think most planners and Mr. McDonald probably vouch for this when they pick up our official plan and read the zoning or the uh, lot coverage policies, they essentially read like a zoning bylaw, uh, very uh, limiting to exactly 10%. We do allow consideration of one tenth. So that's where we get this uh, regular 11% variance application. Um, and what that does, I think it's served the municipality fairly well. It has controlled the amount of density we see along our shorelines with roofed buildings. But I think the development we're starting to experience more of, and, and I think these are the site alteration concerns we're hearing from, is we've gone from roofed buildings to now pools and sport courts and people wanting a rock cut just to put their driveway into the property. And we're seeing a lot of more site alteration on a property, but it's not captured in any existing policy or bylaws because it's not roofed. Mm -hmm. So the suggestions that uh, we're making are to, through the site alteration bylaw and through the site plan control process, put some limitations on those non-roofed buildings 
So it's more of a comprehensive look at how much of a property one can alter, one can develop to ensure that it remains natural. Um, so hopefully that's a very brief right. sort of overview of, I think, the two recommendations before you. Supplementary? Of um, course. Yeah, I appreciate that. And thank you for clarifying that. So maybe you could clarify one other thing then. So now we have roofed structures, which include storage buildings and non-roof structures. And is it, is it now that our official plan currently does not deal with uh, roofed structures either? And, and what I'm getting at is uh, the 10% the or 11% is just in our zoning bylaw. Um, because in my mind, if we have one in the OP, we should have both. But uh, if, if neither are in, then I guess uh, that makes sense. So I wonder if you could answer that. Um, I don't think I understood the question, Mr. Jaglowitz. Could you brief? Again? Okay, David thinks he can answer it for us anyway. So, so let me see if I get it from this one. I'll, I'll try, but uh, certainly uh, please uh, repeat the question if I'm off the mark. Um, currently, the official plan has very detailed, again, policies regarding roofed buildings. And with respect to non-roof buildings, it clearly references that they're allowed. Uh, we have permitted uses along our waterfront, and it essentially says anything accessory to the residential use. We have policies that talk about tennis courts and sport courts and those kind of features. So clearly they're allowed, um, but there's no policy, and then there's no subsequent zoning bylaw or uh, tree preservation or site alteration bylaw that puts a limit on the amount of them. So what happens when staff receives a site plan application we may have some concerns with the overall extent of site alteration that may occur, but our hands are largely tied because uh, we clearly allow tennis courts, we clearly allow pools, uh, all of these things. Uh, and then we can't arbitrarily inform applicants or property owners that they can't have them or they need to be smaller. So we're just suggesting that there's some guidance implemented through the appropriate tools that will put a, put a limit to it. So um, I think to answer your question directly, uh, there are those clear limits and numbers with roofed buildings in the OP and in the zoning bylaw. Uh, there's no guidance in the policies as to size limitations for non-roofed. And then, of course, there's nothing in the implementing bylaws as a result. So, so that was where I was headed. I thought that was the case, um, although I was incorrect on the storage building. So, so in my mind, then, we should have what we're trying to do here is try to keep uh, the lot as natural as possible. So I believe we should have an overall uh, 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 percentage or something uh, that covers roofed and non-roofed, some guideline so that the uh, uh, zoning bylaws can't exceed that, something. Um, because without that, I think you're left, you're left uh, to people coming ZBA after ZBA wanting to increase that. So, so I would suggest that, and I, we can't do it today, but there's either an overall uh, area of the lot that can be disturbed or not disturbed, or there's two numbers, one roofed and one non-roofed, but it might be simpler to just, uh, I don't know. I, I think it's a mistake to leave the non-roofed out of the OP. Uh, I don't think you want to define the size of a tennis court and all of that, that's not what I'm getting at, but some overall upper limit that that is appropriate to, to, to anyway, that's, that's my thinking. And so I'm, I'm a little concerned that we're leaving this whole subject to the, to the zoning bylaw. Mr. McDonald, would you put something about the non-roofed in the, in the OP? I think that's what I'm getting. So we have that direction if we end up somewhere else defending it. Yeah, so I, I guess what I was saying, and I agree that there is a need for some direction. I guess I'm struggling with putting an actual number in the official plan, um, but I'm happy to develop as much direction and rationale for including a number in the site alteration bylaw. I don't think an amenity area coverage number works in your zoning bylaw because of the complexities and challenges in interpretation that would uh, result. I think the site alteration is the best, that the site alteration bylaw is the best place. I, I will note that, you know, there's a general theme in my thinking in terms of how decision making should occur. And given that every property around the lakes is, is innately different for whatever reason, there is a need for some type of discretionary decision making on a case by case basis and the site alteration bylaw allows for that. Going uh, Establishing a development permit system would also allow for that as well. 
And I'm thinking, you know, I'm thinking about the best way to, to achieve your objectives and it's not through the official plan and creating a number. Um, but in the next draft, we'll certainly bolster the rationale for having a number and why it should be in the site alteration bylaw. And then you can take a, a further look at it. Okay, thank you. All right, so committee, do we have maybe a thumbs up as to Mr. McDonald creating, creating wording that's going to bolster bolster us, but no definite number in our official plan. I see if we we're good with that. We're good with that. Okay, thank you. All right, so it's 10 past 12. So I am going to suggest that we break for lunch now and we're back at one o'clock. Um, and I think recreational carrying capacity is next on our list. So have a good lunch, everybody. <laughs> okay, we'll see you in a little bit.
Okay, everybody, could I have everyone back? Five, six, seven. Okay. 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 Welcome back, everyone. I believe Councillor Mazan had to leave us, so we still obviously have quorum here. And uh, I think we're ready, Mr. McDonald, to carry on with uh, RCC. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair Bridgman. Uh, before I do that, I just wanted to mention that Jim Diamond had to also leave for another appointment uh, at 12. So he'll maybe join us uh, later on this afternoon, depending on how long this meeting uh, will go for. Um, so next topic is uh, RCC, another topic of much, just much discussion uh, through the process. And as you all know, uh, through the policy direction formulation phase of this project, uh, Township Council directed us to include the recreational carrying capacity uh, as a hard cap on about 51 small and medium sized lakes in the township. And the lakes were identified as being beyond the cap uh, based on a whole series of calculations we carried out, Jim actually carried those out. Uh, based on uh, the area of the lake uh, and then the surface area of the lake, which is minus the 30 meters close to the shore. And as a consequence of that, 51 lakes would no longer have permissions to create uh, new lots. Um, in terms of uh, the survey and the question we asked, um, we asked whether uh, folks supported uh, this RCC being used as a cap, 77% said yes and 23% uh, no. Uh, those in support uh, believed generally it would be a reasonable thing to do to prohibit overdevelopment. And those in opposition indicated that RCC was way too subjective and should be considered but not made a rule uh, and that restricting new lot creation will not really have a direct impact on the number of boats on a particular lake since this cannot be uh, controlled by the township. And in addition, uh, some of those opposed also uh, indicated that reliance should be placed on minimum lot frontages alone to control uh, density. I did think about the minimum lot frontage angle uh, going forward. And I would note that as a consequence of increasing minimum lot frontages in areas, uh, there will be less potential to create new lots around lakes. So that is something to keep in mind as we go forward. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, uh, lot frontage is a direct frontage of how much shoreline you have. And if you have a nice rectangular lake, uh, you end up with X amount of shoreline, but you've got a, if you have a lake with a lot of bays and inlets and so on, uh, the shoreline would be different. And uh, two lakes that have the same volume could theoretically support different numbers of lots if we only relied upon minimum lot frontage to control uh, the number of, uh, the, I guess, the density on, your, on the lake. But what struck me more, I suppose, in, in terms of thinking with the, about this issue is that uh, we're, we're considering uh, using a tool to prohibit lock creation, um, really to control the social impacts of development on the quality of life uh, on the lake itself uh, and so on. But we're not, um, we don't really have, well, we have no impact or ability to control the number of boats uh, people bring to a lake, the number of boats they store on the lake, uh, the types of boats they use on a property. And in addition, we have very little uh, in, the term, in terms of controls uh, on how folks who already live at the lake uh, or stay at the lake uh, use their properties in terms of how many people are brought onto the property and so on. So while RCC, if we establish, it, if we 
apply to the hard cap will prevent that new lot from being created and the people that come along with it. Uh, my thinking is that it would be the impact is perhaps a little overstated uh, given the number of vacant lots we already have around many lakes and given that we have no control over uh, how uh, vacant lots, well, we have controls on the type of development that it can, can occur, but we don't have any control in terms of the social impacts that, com that come with developing on vacant lots or redeveloping um, existing lots. So my thinking is that RCC is a valuable tool. I recognize it's being used by others, um, but I'm thinking uh, that it should, should be one of a number of tools used in the toolbox to make decisions on law creation uh, around the lakes uh, that are affected. And as a consequence, I do think it has value. Uh, I do think uh, there, is an, there is merit in considering it, um, but I don't think it should be the only tool uh, uh, relied upon to uh, make decisions on whether law creation is important or not, or should occur or not. And what I'm thinking is that um, RCC, uh, if a lake is uh, over capacity, according to the calculations, uh, there are a number of other things that we can do or the township can do um, in their official plan and zoning bylaw to control uh, the impacts of development on a lake generally. And they're listed on my page um, 17, and that's reducing the minimum dwelling unit size and the height of buildings on a lot. Some of the lake plans are already doing that. I anticipate uh, as more lake plans get done, uh, this will become more and more common. Uh, prohibiting the construction of boat houses if they're already permitted. In some cases, they're not anyway, so it's not, not that is, a, is not uh, not applicable. Uh, establishing reduced permissions for dock widths and or lengths. Uh, not permitting sun decks on the roof of one-story boat houses. Again, only if boat houses are permitted in the first place. Not permitting sleeping cabins reducing permitted law coverage again, which is what some of the lake plans are doing, increasing the required amount of lot area and or lot frontage for new lot creation. So that's possible. And lastly, requiring a greater setback than 20 meters for new dwellings. And I, I'm thinking that all of those things combined uh, will have a positive impact in terms of reducing uh, social impacts uh, on lakes. So my recommendation number eight uh, is that RCC uh, not be used as a hard cap uh, to prohibit law creation on its own and that it be a consideration when new lots are proposed. Uh, the official plan indicate that if a lake is over capacity according to the calculation, new lots could be considered provided adequate measures like the ones I've just gone through are taken to ensure the creation of the lot doesn't contribute to overcrowding of the lake surface area. And secondly, minimize the overall social impacts resulting from additional development on the new lot. Uh, but what I'm also thinking is that uh, whatever rules we want to apply potentially to new lot creation, we should also be thinking about changing the rules that apply to existing lots as well, if, re regardless if they're vacant or they're already developed. So someone comes in with a vacant lot, uh, consideration could be given to changing the zoning bylaw to implement some of the restrictions I talked about. Uh, and if somebody's looking to redevelop an existing lot, uh, restrict additional restrictions can also be placed on that lot as well. And, and my thinking is, is, is really this, is that we're creating uh, fairness around the lake in terms of how the rules are applied. Uh, and and if, if, if restrictive rules are gonna be applied to new lots, um, if this recommendation is endorsed, then I'm thinking restrictive rules should also be applied to existing lots as well, whether they're vacant or already developed, uh, because the overall plan and idea here is, is to reduce the overall impact of having people around the lake, on the lake, and the quality of life of the people that live around it. So that's my recommendation. Um, I know we were proponents of using RCC as a hard cap. Uh, we definitely still think it's a good idea. Um, but in looking at how it would be implemented and whether it would be a fair uh, policy to, to apply, uh, my thinking is that it wouldn't be a fair policy and it is overly punitive um, against those who, who may have the ability to create new lots around lakes. Now, keep, keep in mind, of course, that any lake uh, on which uh, law creation is already prohibited because of causation studies, that obviously still stays, that, 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 still be, that still remains a policy. 
And of course, we've all we've also increased lot primates in areas around all lakes in the township, which will further decrease the potential for new law creation in any event. So that's my recommendation, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Um, thank you, and through you. Um, I think this is a good direction to go in. I agree with A, B, but is C, if you could change restrict to consider, uh, because not only should we be looking at RCC, but lake plans, lake agreements, public accessage, and uses John the Lake before we decide to restrict development. Um, I'm just thinking of an example would be Thorn Lake that has no gas boats um, on the entire lake. And it would be, uh, it, it, it would be restrictive to the owners if we were to say, you have the same usage by RCC. Um, so not restrict them when you use all four. And I think it makes us look better at if we do go to the land tribunal, because we've not only looked at one thing, but we've looked at the lake plans, the lake agreements, whether or not there's public access. And I think once we cover all the bases, we'll know which ones are sensitive. Okay, thank you. Councillor Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, and through you. Um, the, there was a lot of emphasis on, on um, the boat count and the impact and it was and um, is it, RCC is just not one thing. It's not, it's not boats. It's not so just social. And so I think that we've got to let this go forward as is to the public because there was such a strong support from the public which communicated in the survey that recreation carry, carrying capacity really does deserve full discussion and comments at a public meeting. And um, so I'm, I'm, I, I, I want to hear more from the public on this and I want wholesome discussion and not just the t 10 of us around the, around the room. I may or may not agree with what's being said, but I think it's got to go to the public because there was such strong support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. So you're saying it has to still go to the public as a hard cap because it would be going anyway. Right, even if yep. it was soft. All right, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you, I I, I just want to uh, I may be uh, splitting hairs, but I uh, want to ask uh, Mr. McDonald or, or uh, make a point for Mr. McDonald. From what I hear you, how I hear you describing RCC, it's not exactly the same way that I interpret it. It's not really a measure, to my knowledge, of boating activity or a me I mean, if not. It's not a way to restrict boating activity or social engagement. It's, it's almost like a proxy or a barometer for overdevelopment. If the water is too full of boats, um, then that tells you that the waterfront is probably at its capacity for development. The, I, I don't, I mean, the way I heard you describe it, and it may mean, mean exactly the same thing, but the way I was interpreting your explanation, uh, it's a tool to decide how we reduce the number of boats on the water. I don't think that's it at all. I think the idea is it's a tool whereby we determine when a lake has reached its, its full, its fullness. It's, you know, hit, hit its, uh, its uh, maximum capacity. And, and maybe they mean the same thing and maybe the result is the same, but I really think that having a hard cap can work. I have some questions and issues about whether it works on large lakes or whether you can break it down and make it applicable to specific bays or specific parts of a big lake. But I think the goal is to use it as a barometer for um, the capacity to, to extend development around the, the uh, waterfront rather than a way to control the number of boats on the lake. We don't want the overdevelopment. If everybody agrees just to have one boat, we'd solve the boating problem in a hurry, but we'd still overdevelop the waterfront. That's really not the goal, I don't think. Anyhow, thank you. Oh, and sorry, before I hang up, I agree with uh, Councillor Roberts. Uh, I think we've we've socialized this, talked about it enough. We've got people interested in it. I think it does, does deserve to go to public for their uh, input and feedback. And, and, and I won't be surprised at all if once they hear the full explanation 
they decide they don't want to move with it, but I think it needs to be given that treatment. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Uh, Mr. McDonald, I don't think you need to comment on that, but do you want to? Uh, just very quickly, I, I, I agree with how uh, Councillor Kelly is describing it. I kind of described it a little bit differently. Uh, it certainly is a tool that, that allows for the consideration of how many people use the water, whether it's with a boat or not. So I, I, I get all of that. Uh, it is a theoretical tool, and I think we all understand that. Um, and, and it applies to a lake regardless of context. Um, so some lakes will have less usage because that's just the way the lake is because of its history, uh, the nature of the people that live there, and another lake may be quite different and used differently based on that context. And that's one of the challenges I have with applying it um, as, as a hard cap. But I really do see the value uh, in RCC in decision making for sure. Um, so just a quick response on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Zavitz. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess to what Nick just said, uh, more of a moderating influence from my perspective. I don't I don't really believe I want to see it as a hard cap yet. I do like the idea that we've um, fashioned this into our language. It's becoming part of our um, our discussion and uh, for everyone to see. I do like recommendation uh, 8AB and with the change as recommended by uh, Councillor um, uh, Hayes to to see. Uh, I'm quite fine with it. I'm not in favor of a hard cap, though. Okay, thank you, Councillor Nishikawa. Thank you. I think uh, my question is, I, I still don't understand recreational carrying capacity. We we look at it from a development perspective, but there's a few lakes on our list here that I will say that since COVID got very, very busy from um, public boat launches. And, and in fact, in some cases, camping actually occurred on um, sort of remote uh, locations. Um, but I don't understand how we capture that amount of um, people um, you know, using Long Lake, for instance, that normally would never have in the past, but that's continuing on and on. And I, I don't understand how you balance all of that. Like who's going to do that work, I guess, sort of thing. And I guess just to respond to that quickly, uh, Chair Bridgman, uh, you're correct. The calculations only take into account uh, the cottages, dwellings around the lake. They don't take into account the activities that may be carried out on, on some of the larger properties like a campground or the public boat launches. Um, I suppose it could, um, we've never, we haven't done it that way, um, but that, that, that gets to you know, one of my points about how fair is the calculation if it doesn't take everything into account in the outcome is, is really what I'm getting at. I, I think it, it, it does really well in terms of looking at the number of cottages and dwellings, but it doesn't take what you're, what you're referencing into account. And I'm not sure how easy that is to do because figuring out how many people use a boat launch, that, that's speculative. And it really depends on weather, uh, COVID, <laughs> pandemics, and other things that sometimes we have no control over. Okay, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Bridgman. Uh, I agree that this should go out to the uh, public and that. And I also agree with uh, and that Nick on this, that um, if it's an undersized lot, say it's a 100 foot lot and, and it, it should be 200 feet, then they should be uh, and not restricted to lot coverage. Maybe uh, if it's 8% on a small lake, 4%, 5% so that uh, we, we, we do uh, con control these lots that there's a lot, a lot of lots of, of record that are only a hundred feet. Uh, I wouldn't restrict them building on them, but I, I sure would uh, contail uh, the, the amount of uh, development on it. And there's some uh, of the factors that, uh, that Nick had said from one to eight, I think that's a, a real good starting point. And I'd like to see what the public has to say about that. Thank you. Hey, uh, Mayor Harding. Um, 
Thank you. As I'm listening to the conversation, I, I don't think anybody around this table is really firm that RCC is a hard cap. I think we're all understanding that it's one of the tools. And I think that's Mr. McDonald's comment is that it needs to be circulated as one of the tools, not the tool. And it, it's a subtle difference, but I think when you add points B and C to his comment, that it makes for a more fulsome discussion about RCC um, and how it may be used in controlling overdevelopment of the lot. I, my, my fear is if we put it out there that just says hard stop, no pun intended, this is RCC and we're going to put it in and this is what the policy would look like. We're not going to get as much discussion around points B and C because people can say, well, all of these lakes are over capacity at this point. So there's no more. Com that's all we're going to evaluate. And I think as a planning matter, we're bigger than that. So I, I like the way it's worded um, and that Mr. McDonald's done that. I think he's given greater thought. I appreciate the public's direction and uh, public doesn't always know everything contemplated in the concept of RCC and how it implements. So uh, I think we're going in the right direction in this particular case, and I'm supportive of putting this out there as his eighth recommendation. Okay, thank you. Councillor Roberts. Ah, uh, I don't know where to start, and I'm sort of speaking twice, but the public knows much more than anyone sitting around this table on RCC, excluding uh, Jim Diamond and Nick McDonald. The public for the last few years have, in the small lakes, have really studied this, have done investigation. So, and I, for one, I'm not convinced that hard cap is not the way to go. I am want to decide. Now, I want to pick up on one point that was mentioned that we, you know, it's not a, a fair measurement because it doesn't take into account everything. Well, it doesn't take into account the significant impact of the boat lunch, the significant impact on the lake of a campground type of thing. So, um, it, it, it's. Uh, I, 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 right now, this this needs to go out the way it is. We can get the experts or more expert type of people to come in. Maybe, perhaps, rather than just a tool, because tool is a four a four lettered word, is that it is a once it it reaches RCC, there's a set of criteria that are mandatory, not just left to an opinion of group of tools. So. Um, that's what I would would think that we really got to think more about this. And yes, I I say they really got to think hard on this because RCC will limit um, you know a, a lot of development. But um, we got to get the small lakes that are really pushing this to get there. Really listen to them rather than just in a, for, a public forum, but it's to sit down and really understand what they what they're trying to to fix. Thank you. So, Mr. McDonald, I have a question for you. Some of our lake plans actually have this as part of their lake plan. Does that, does that, what, what predominates when you're looking yeah, at a, a new lot creation on one of those lakes? So, so that's, so that's a great question. I was thinking about that as, as, as you were all speaking, and I should have mentioned that is that, of course, if a lake plan is done, in my view, uh, the lake plan takes precedent, um, provided, of course, that the that you as a council are satisfied that the process was, that a proper process was followed and that divergent points of view were considered, you know, with those provisos, in my view, the lake plan would take precedence. And if we went down the road, I'm suggesting if there are uh, certain small lakes or groups of lakes that, that come forward and say, this is what they're looking for based on the work that they've done, then that would be the way to solve it for that lake in question. Um, so that that door is always open uh, for folks to walk through. Thank you. So you answered my question. I like that way better. It is a tool to be used, but if a lake plan is in place and that's what the lake wants, then they have the ability to hard cap it. So I think it gives us more flexibility. Um, Okay, so I am going to ask here, I know Councillor Roberts, there are a couple of people who want this to stay as a hard cap when it goes out to the public. So I'm now going to ask 
directly, do, do we want to not take this recommendation and stay with it as a hard cap on these 51 lakes when it goes out to the public? Those in favor of keeping the hard cap, just give me your thumbs up. Okay, we've got three. Those that would like to see uh, the recommendation go out as, as crafted here through Mr. McDonald. Five. That's five, five, three. It, okay, so it will go, we're missing Councilor Mazan. We only have yeah. nine, okay? Yeah. All right, so Mr. McDonald, I believe that goes out as recommended. Five, three. Oh, five, three. Wait a minute, who are we? Yeah, wait a minute. <laughs> Where's Frank? Fra Frank, what are you voting? Uh, you asking me to speak, Chair? Uh, hey, well, uh, we, I, I think I we did, missed your vote. Yes, because um, I was thinking about it. Uh, my preference would be that it goes out as a question. In other words, um, that uh, there are two options. One is a hard cap and one is not a hard cap. So that was my preference. I didn't know how to vote because it kind of straddled both camps. So you direct, uh, but is, as we all know, if you don't vote, it's, it's a no. But that, 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 that's where my thinking was. Okay, um, anybody on Councillor Jagowitz thinking? Just try to keep this all completely democratic, no? So I believe it still carries at five, five, four. So Mr. McDonald, let's put it out that way and I'm sure we'll have responses wanting a hard, a hard cap again. All right, uh, on to your next recommendation. Right, so the next series of uh, recommendations uh, deal with uh, commercial accommodation and there were a number of questions posed in the survey and I'll try to summarize all of them. I guess in, as, a, as a general comment, um, many, many if not all of what was suggested in the draft plan is supported by the folks that, uh, that responded. Um, however, some of the questions were a little too complicated, if I can put it that way, for folks to really understand what the question was, but I'll leave that aside. So I'll just go through um, that this particular section, section I. Um, and basically the intent of, of, of the revised policies, as we all know, because we've talked about them for quite a bit, is to really ensure that hotels um, and, and motels and others are, particularly resorts, are planned from the outset and continue to be commercial in nature and available to the traveling public uh, to continue attracting visitors to the area. And then we posed a number of questions uh, along those lines. Um, so question 19 in the survey was, um, um, so we basically said, asked whether, so sorry, let me back up. So the draft official plan proposed to permit resort uh, commercial accommodation uses on resort properties outside of the urban centers, provide each unit uh, generates uh, uh, turnover of occupants through mandatory rental pools, programs, exchanges, time sharing, and so on. And it goes on to indicate uh, that the owner can only use a unit for a maximum of 26 weeks in the calendar year and a maximum of four weeks in July and August. And those are basically the same restrictions we put in place uh, through the Manette uh, process. So we're basically carrying that forward and making that a township wide policy outside again of the urban centers. In response to the questions, 63% uh, said yes, 37% no. Uh, and while most of the respondents said they support it, uh, a, a number still had concerns about the policy being too permissive um, and others still had concerns about the policy continuing to encourage higher density developments on the township lakes. Townships lakes. Other respondents didn't really understand the rationale led to the policy and felt that they had to vote yes or no, uh, but they were concerned about it being unenforceable. Uh, enforceability is definitely a challenge. We, we have a lot of, uh, we, we have a good understanding of that. Uh, but at, in the end of the day, I continue to recommend that including a detailed set of rec restrictions on occupancy is necessary to provide clarity on the township's expectations on this policy should be carried forward into the next draft of the official plan. I'm also aware that a few comments were made uh, by uh, Federation of Muskoka or MLA uh, or both, I can't recall, uh, that looked to strengthen some of that wording along the lines of what we did with the Manette official plan amendment, because that came afterwards, and, and those make sense. Uh, so we will be doing that. 
to the best of our abilities to make sure that the policies of Minette and the policies outside of Minette as it relates to this issue are as aligned as possible going forward. Um, so that's my recommendation on the issue of turnover. Okay, thank you. Welcome back, Councillor Mazan. Um, okay, do I have any comments from anyone? Uh, Councillor Jagowitz. Uh, thank you. Uh, actually, I support this uh, this recommendation, but I believe there's two other things that haven't been dealt with, and I'm not sure, Chair, if they belong in this item. I couldn't find another item. As you know, commercial resorts are a very important part of our uh, OP, and there are two issues that haven't been dealt with, and one is uh, density, and the other is a uh, lot in siting. And I wondered if I might address them in this point, or do you prefer that they come in at a later point in this discussion? All right, uh, just let me ask you, Councillor Jagowitz, are you talking about what's in it, what's in our Manette OPA in terms of those references and they're not here? Is that what you're referring to? Uh, when we talk about density, I'm talking about one part of it's in the Manette and one part of it's in Seguin's bylaw. When I talk about uh, lot in siting, there, there are provisions that are in our current official plan that for some reason didn't get carried forward into this one. So I think that's a question for Mr. McDonald. Yeah, I, I, I think I understand where you're going, uh, uh, where you're going, Councillor. And there are uh, provisions that establish minimum frontages and minimum areas for new resorts. And we did not carry that forward. I think there is merit in actually doing that and considering an increase in size as appropriate. And that's something Mr. Pink and myself will, will talk about. So something like that, I think makes some sense. In terms of the siting and location, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what you're getting at, uh, Councillor. Um, so perhaps you can expand on that point and I can consider it. Yes, uh, well, they're in, they're in the existing official plan uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I'm getting myself mixed up. You're, you're agreeing with the uh, frontage and, and area definition, yes. that, that part. Uh, the, the, the density part, uh, the first part that's in Sigwon is they limit uh, the accommodation units to uh, uh, one every, for every six meters of frontage or one for every 20 feet. And then the Manette, uh, um, uh, the Manette uh, bylaw talks about um, um, the size of that uh, of that unit. In other words, that it's not just a room or a three, it's like an 850 square foot cottage. So, so putting those together, uh, they, they have a, a limit on some, some upper limit on, uh, on that. And that, and uh, as I say, one was in the sequin bylaw and the, the second part was in the Manette. So you've already agreed to carry the Manette part forward, uh, which is the definition of 850 square feet. The other is then having some idea of what density uh, might be expected. And, and that, that particular one is, uh, is um, 10 units per hectare or four units per acre. And then uh, uh, based on the fr uh, on frontage, uh, one every six meters or 20 feet. And, and those are fair comments. And, and actually, Mr. Pink and I have been having conversations on and off about that moving forward in terms of how we can do that in the new official plan um, uh, as it relates to this issue. Uh, there's also an issue in terms of how density is calculated um, and whether it only applies to the front portion of the property near the waterfront or it extends as far back as as it can. Um, so those, I, I guess I can't give you an answer right now in terms of what it'll look like, but I agree in principle that those are good ideas that should be in the official plan. Uh, Mr. Pink, any additional comments on that? Mr. Pink. Thank you, Chair. I, I think uh, just wanted to agree that yes, those, those policies need to be carried forward, but I think rather than, um, and Mr. McDonald, I can go through the details and come back with something but rather than the segment approach or what we do in our uh, settlement areas, which is a, a unit cap uh, per acreage, uh, what our current official plan policy state and our zoning bylaw, we, uh, we have a uh, sort of a categorization of resorts into four different zoning categories and we limit gross floor area 
depending on which category you're in. So uh, ranging from, you know, very remote, small resorts on small lakes to uh, the very large, uh, and it will be a gradient. And we find that that gross flow area limitation is much more restrictive than a, than a unit count. Um, the unit count we use in our settlement areas, and, and we've heard some comments about the uh, extent of development allowed uh, there, and that seems to be the approach Sequin is taking. So, but to summarize, we don't necessarily have to hash out those details right here. I think the clear message, and we've agreed, is we will look at the existing policies and make sure that uh, the appropriate ones are carried forward with respect to density, lot and site requirements, unit sizes, et cetera. So then one, one quick supplementary. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pleased with, with that response. Uh, I would hope though that looking at um, <clears throat> the resorts that are, were in Manette, I hope the gross square footage doesn't give the uh, uh, number of units that uh, on the one resort that's being developed there, as you recall, uh, it didn't define what a unit was. Uh, do you know what I mean? Or square footage, and it has much more development rights. Anyway, I'm choking on my words. Let, let me say, I'm hopeful that you will approach the densities more similar to what was done in the Manette uh, rather than what's in our current. That, that, uh, do, you, do you understand what I'm trying to say? I think 4,000 units on the, that one property is, is very, very, very excessive. I hope that's not what our, our new OP is going to say. No, absolutely not. I mean, Minette is a is a special policy area. It has its own set of policies and the densities that come along with it. Quite frankly, I don't anticipate anything like that anywhere else in the township. Just mm -hmm. I just don't see it. Um, so the density policy, while we may use some of Minette's policies, such as unit count, the turnover stuff, and so on, the density will be different than Minette and less than Minette, obviously. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I don't see any further comments. So are we in agreement that we'll move ahead with this direction? And Mr. McDonald and Mr. Pink will bring back a little more detail on what we talked about today. So we're all good with that? Great. Okay, Mr. Oh. Okay, so uh, the next one is question 21. So the uh, draft plan proposed to, develop, to support development of single owner accommodation uses and discourage the development of commercial accommodation by plan of condominium outside of the urban centers. And again, survey participants were asked whether they support this approach, 79% yes, 21% no. I continue to believe that this is the right direction for the township to take with this type of development. Um, and I, can, I recommend that this direction be carried forward into the next draft of the official plan. Any comments committee? I think we're I think we're all good with that, Mr. McDonald. So Great. let's move on. Okay. Question twenty three, um, and I, I think this will be simple too. The draft also proposed to require that a variety of substantive resort related amenities and services be available on site, and then in person management be available as well. Again, survey respondents were asked whether they support this approach, and it was eighty six percent yes, and fourteen percent said no. Um, so I, I continue to believe this is a good approach for the township to take. It was directed to be added uh, by planning committee at a, at, in the past, and, and it has been added. And I continue to believe it's the right approach. So no changes suggested. Okay, committee, any comments? Nope, oh, I think that means agreement. So let's move on. Okay, questions 25 and 26 dealt with the uh, downzoning of resort properties. Um, currently, they're, uh, they're um, identified as employment lands and can only be changed uh, through a comprehensive review, which means anytime the official plan is updated, we're proposing to take that restriction away and allow for the downzoning of properties provided uh, appropriate justifications uh, uh, is submitted for consideration and also provided that the alternative use uh, makes sense and certainly not at the densities uh, that existed uh, with the uh, previous use. Um, we then asked whether the proposed criteria we identified were appropriate um, and in terms of whether uh, downzoning was a good idea or supported, 76% said yes, 24% said no. And in, with respect to the criteria, probably a difficult question to ask in a survey format, but 61% uh, said yes and 
50% said no, but many who responded to that particular question uh, didn't have the criteria in front of them, so they weren't really able uh, to comment on it. Um, so I think going forward that the approach we're taking is the right one. Uh, I do, however, think that additional clarity is needed in, in what we've come up with to make it uh, as clear as possible what the township's expectations are. Um, so with that in mind, my recommendation is that they be carried forward and that they be refined to provide the additional clarity that is needed. That's recommendation 12. Okay, committee, any comments? Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm sure you all have heard me express this opinion before, and I may be um, alone in this, but uh, I believe these are employment lands. I believe uh, if we allow them to be down zoned, we'll never get them back. Um, however, there are issues with some of them, and maybe down zoning is appropriate in some cases, but it should not be taken lightly. So if this is going to get enacted, I think it has to be worded in such a way that down zoning is the last resort and that all avenues to, to protect these as uh, employment lands be, uh, be, be tried. Um, I, know, I know it sounds simple to take a place like a camp that may be a large piece of property that has a potential zoning and to take it and down zone it into several residential lots. But that takes that piece of property that exists here that has been used for years. I'm not talking about a particular one, but and, it, and we no longer will be able to have that type of use on the lake. So, so I think it has to be taken very seriously. I know a lot of people don't support me on this, but I, I still have to express it. I think, uh, I, I think resorts in that activity is a very important part of our, of our township and they should be protected at all costs. Um, there are times when, when they're, they fall out of favor. But interestingly enough, with the pandemic, um, uh, you know, people, uh, more people came up here. So, so anyway, those are my thoughts. So I, I don't, I'm not opposed to what's going on. I just think there should be a lot of care given to it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kelly. Uh, thank you. And through you, I'm going to uh, support uh, Councillor Jagowitz's sentiment. Uh, these are employment lands. They uh, ability to down zone should be a big challenge. And, and I frankly don't understand why we're proposing to take it from where it is now, where it has to be part of a comprehensive review and, and lessen the burden uh, at all. Okay, so help me understand that, Councillor Kelly. We can't down zone right now. Can't. So. Right. But I, I don't think we can look at employment lands in isolation and make a decision to um, change the character or lose the, the important, uh, lose the value of them as uh, employment lands unless it's in conjunction with a bigger review of the, uh, of the uh, you know, and a comprehensive review of the official plan, unless it's part of a bigger uh, picture. I, I think if we make it too easy on an individual property basis, we're going to lose them and regret it down the road. Thank you. I understand that better now. Thank you. Um, Mayor Harding. Um, I, I think this new policy is in the right direction. Uh, as much as we call these employment lands, they are no longer employment lands. We have one or two big resorts that will support employment lands. And we have a number of commercial properties that are actually probably being operated more as private residences and cottages and should be continued as private residences and cottages and allowed to be down zoned with lesser densities allowed on the properties. Our economy has changed drastically from a resort based tourism based economy that we saw in the 50s, 60s or 70s or even the 80s to where we are at today we create a problem, we want employment lands, but nobody wants to have the staff live in towns. And many of these small resort commercial properties don't have space to have and house their own staff. And if somebody wants to come to us, we're, we're all, we've heard time and time again, some of these small resorts can't afford to be a small resort. They wanna be condominiumized because they have to sell them to people because renting hotel rooms 
as a resort doesn't financially work anymore. And yet we're taking away a lot of that because it can't be condominiumized. We are creating these properties not to become economically successful in any way, shape or form. And in fairness, I would rather see a spade called a spade. And if we have a resort commercial property, I'll take Madame Homes property on Ferndale Road. It does some corporate stuff. It's a corporate property, but it should truly be down zoned to a residence at this particular time. And we would stop all development. We wouldn't have five boathouses on the property because it's still under a commercial zone. So I, I'm totally in favor of this uh, policy going forward. And uh, again, for those who don't know, my background was running and managing resort waterfronts across this province. So I've seen a lot of my old hotels no longer in business because the economy has changed and I don't see it coming back anytime soon. Thank you. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, is this grandfathered? Or, or if this goes through, do we look at those properties that are now running as personal residences on commercial land and are we going to make them down zone? I, I assumed we were, this would be grandfathered because, okay, Mr. McDonald? Yeah, so so the policy is 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 future looking, of course. So it, it it's trying to anticipate circumstances in the future where someone doesn't want to operate the property as a, as a as a commercial property, it wants to convert to something else. In terms of how the existing properties are zoned and dealt with, that's a great question. That's not really an OP question. It's more of a zoning by implementation question. And Dave and I have had a few conversations about well. What happens if, if the direction of the township is to really discourage, you know, resort development by, by condominium? What does that really mean for the existing properties? And maybe they should be, their zoning should be changed. The question is who initiates that? Should that be the private property owner or that, should that be the township? So that's a broad discussion, perhaps for, for another day. But to address the, the comment about whether these should be employment lands and only looked at every five years, Personally, I don't really see what the benefit of that would be, particularly if there is no alternative use. The, the idea behind uh, not uh, permitting uh, the consideration of conversions you know, in five or 10 year increments is because you hope that an alternative use would come in, buy the land and use it. But if it's clear that that's just not possible, it doesn't seem fair to me to ask that person to wait five or 10 years to make an application or, or make a request to convert to something else. The property goes into disrepair during that time, it may become a blight on the landscape. So I'm not sure there's any benefit. And I'm thinking that the policies we've come up with are pretty rigorous and onerous. And in the end, council will have to make a decision on whether it makes sense to convert to another use based on the evidence that's being provided. And if they've done not a very good job in doing that justification, you're, you're, you're in your rights to say, no, it doesn't make sense. And I think that's the most proper approach and fair to those folks who wanna proceed in down zone. Okay, thank you. I was just thinking of people listening in who may be on those properties and wondering if the grandfathering would be in effect, but we, we normally, grandfather when we do do something new like this okay I don't um I don't see any more comments uh do we have uh everybody in favor of moving this out as the recommendation stands okay all right so I believe we're down to your last recommendation Mr. McDonald and you are you're on mute Mr. McDonald Sorry about that. Yeah, and just after that, I, we did have another question in the survey dealing with uh, the sharing economy. It doesn't have an OP related, um, um, I guess, impact, but we did ask the question, both David and I thought it would make sense if we did just to, to, to get a gauge of, of what folks are thinking about licensing and so on. Uh, so we asked whether uh, it, made, it would make sense for the township to explore uh, regulatory options to regulate this use. Uh, and 67% said yes, and 33% said no. Uh, so that doesn't result in any changes to, to, to the OP, um, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, the next one deals with uh, rural lock creation and um, 
as you've already heard uh, through previous discussions, we've basically standardized the rural lot creation policies across the rural areas so that they are the same. Uh, you may recall that there were two or three or even four different rules in place depending on geography. And we thought that was way too confusing and it was better to be a bit more specific and clear about what the township's expectations are. Um, so we've come up with a new policy framework that basically says limitations on the number of lots that can be created are being lifted, but new lots have to have an area of 150 meters and two hectares. Um, and we asked in the survey whether folks supported that or not. 63% said yes and 37% uh, said no. Uh, we don't think that this policy in of itself will open the floodgates to many more lots being created. Uh, just based on the layout of the township, uh, the lack of road access in many places and, and environmental features and so on uh, that act as constraints to development. So we don't think it will uh, dramatically increase uh, law creation potential. Um, those in favor of the approach said for reasons you've already heard, develops uh, supports development of more needed housing. And those opposed were concerned about the potential overdevelopment in rural areas. Uh, we continue to think the potential for rural lot creation remains low uh, after applying these policies and the other policies of applying the district's plan as well. So we continue to believe that the current approach uh, makes sense and we recommend that it uh, remain as is in the official plan going forward. Okay, any comments, Mehdi? No, all right, Mr. McDonald, I think that's your answer. We're good with that. So, great, so the last recommendation in the memorandum deals with uh, Walker's Point. Um, and as we know, there's been lots of discussion about uh, Walker's Point and there is there remains a desire for Walker's Point to be identified as a community area, uh, which means um, it, it being a settlement area as per the district plan and the township's plan. Uh, we indicated last time around that we couldn't do that because the district doesn't identify Walker's Point as a, as, a, as a settlement area, so we can't on our own. Of course, if the district did, then we can, uh, but basically the way the rules are on you know, where settlement areas are and what their boundaries are start with the district. They don't start uh, with the township. Having said that, we did include a policy that basically said enhanced non-residential permissions will be considered through an update to the up, to the implementing zoning bylaw and recognition of the size and role Walker's Point plays in the larger community. We also came up with a new category of, uh, of hamlet and we're, we called it rural hamlet areas. They're still not settlement areas, but, but we came up with something to put them on a map so they show up on all of the schedules. Um, and in response for this desire for recognition, we note uh, that the, the official plan actually would permit many of the same uses um, as permitted in a community area in a rural hamlet area, and it would permit smaller lots than in the surrounding rural areas. So we have done some different things to, in Walker's Point to recognize uh, its importance uh, to the community. So, the only other thing we can think of to, to, to satisfy this desire for recognition, which I fully understand, is that instead of calling these areas rural hamlet areas, perhaps we should call them rural, sorry, local community areas. So you get the community in there um, and we still make it clear it's not a settlement area, um, but we call it local community area and that we include policies that direct that appropriate signage and landscaping be introduced at the entrances to any of the local community areas we have where it doesn't exist presently. And I think that's probably as far as we can go short of it being called a community area. Um, and as mentioned, we can't do that unilaterally. That has to start at the district and, and feedback to us for that to actually happen. Um, so that's my last, our last recommendation, recommendation 14. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hayes. Thank you, I'll be brief. Um, I, I'd like to thank Jim and Nick and David for all their guidance in getting this to the finish line. Um, the local community area has 
kind of been accepted by everybody. It's a good compromise. Um, they did send in 10 bullet points that they would like attached to the Walker's Point area. Um, I, I can get it down to three if that helps. Um, and that is to maintain, identify, enhance, and celebrate the distinctive character, identity, and the rich heritage of Walker's Point Barlaken. Second one would be to encourage and maintain and support the development of parks, trails, gardens, and various forms of water access on township owned lands. And the third bullet would be to encourage, maintain, and support the development of heritage, memorial, and archived sites and dedications on township lands. Um, if we could include those three bullets under Walker's Point, um, that would be, you'd make a lot of people happy. Well, Mr. McDonald, are you going to make a lot of people happy? I, I, I think I'd like to do that. So okay. those are great suggestions and uh, that, that could be certainly uh, accommodated for sure. Thank you very much. I'm sure I you'll get that. that along. I'm sure you'll get that to him, Councillor Hayes. Okay, well, that is the end of Mr. McDonald's recommendations. I'm now going to ask committee if there are other, any other areas that they would like to bring up for discussion at this point. Okay, I'm seeing none. Oh, I'm seeing Councillor Roberts. Thank you. There's, there's two that um, I'd like to bring up. I'd like a, um, a, a somewhat of a discussion on lake plans and our thoughts behind that. And the other one, I just have a comment uh, on aggregates. So I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start with lake plans, first of all, off, if it's okay with you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Okay, the, um, it's been do well documented that the township has been very supportive of, of lakes to provide lake plans and that they, they could be to be included in the, the official plan. But given the, the point that, you know, the, the lake plan, the lakes would be on their own, and not supported by the township, sort of says, well, why do we even bother to ask them for their points? I know that they all thought, that like, and, and the lake plans you'll notice came from a ward, ward B. I don't think there was any other lake, uh, any ward that, that created a lake plan. But they were all under the misunderstanding that, the, 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 that their, their um, um, rec recommendations, suggestions would be, would be heard by the township and, and supported by the township or told that they couldn't. And basically, I, I think that uh, I, it was wrong of us to to ask for lake plans if we weren't going to support them going through, forward. Because these 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 associations put a lot of time and effort. And I know I can just speak to one that's I think is the most threatened lake in in Ward Ward B, which is Little Long Lake. And I know the Lake Jim McKenna McKenna really was very concerned with the lake and was really thinking that if, if he could get his point across to the township that they would proactively help that that community protect that lake from destruction but but it doesn't appear that's happening so i just want to what the thoughts of my my, my colleagues on lake plants um should we should we even like what's what's the value now even given a, a few minutes ago we talked about recreation carry capacity and we said that if if a, if, a, if let's say um, that uh, there there was three or four of them said they wanted recreation carrying capacity, and let's use um, Leonard Lake as an example. But what I'm hearing is that the township be supportive, but it would be up to the the lake to defend it. And so, is that correct? My understanding is that the way we're going to go with this. Okay, so let me ask Mr. McDonald. I think what we're talking about is like an, o an appeal to the OLT. The authors have to bring it forward. We could be a supporting factor, but we're not going to bring it forward. Is that, I think that's what you're asking, Councillor Roberts. Yes, somewhat. And, and would, would they, would they um, put, uh, well, Chris, very sure, would we put skin in the game to help? support Little Long Lake or Three Mile Lake, or would they be on their own um, 
at the tribunals. Okay, Mr. McDonald. Yeah, you know, and, and looking what I uh, looking at what I wrote here, it does seem a little harsh in terms of the township will not support lake planning. I, I think it really has to do with what is in the lake plan and how much more restrictive it is compared to the township's overall policy. Pick an example, 8% law coverage is permitted on some lakes and a lake plan comes in and says, okay, we think it should be 6%. I think that's easily supportable just based on context. But there may be circumstances where recommendations come in through lake plans that are more difficult to support. Um, so perhaps what I should have said is that, well, lake plans should be well developed, um, uh, go through rigorous public processes. And in the end, as I mentioned earlier in this meeting, council should be satisfied uh, that, that, that what the lake plan suggests is supportable or has been supported by the majority of, however that's defined, of the folks yes. around the lake before making uh, a decision. But there may be a circumstance where something comes forward that can't be supported, but the lake plan uh, is, is, is supportive of it. So I probably should add it a bit more nuance uh, into that going forward. Um, and you know, with respect to boathouses being prohibited on Leonard Lake, it is permitted now. Uh, and that's a prohibition that, that the lake plan has, has, has put forward. Uh, personally, I'm, 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 I'm not sure I've seen all the justification for it, but that may be an example of something. Well, perhaps the lake plan uh, folks uh, would have to support that if there was a, a challenge to it at, at the Ontario Land Tribunal going forward. Uh, again, I think it's going to depend on every lake plan and what it does and how it does it and how uh, much support it had going forward. These are like mini official plans, and uh, yes. uh, right? And, and there's push and pull in each of these. And uh, what works on one lake may not work on another lake for a whole variety of reasons. And that's why lake plans are encouraged because they recognize the local character um, of, of that particular lake. So I guess my answer is, um, I couldn't tell you what the township could or could not support. It really depends on the planner you ask at the time, whether it's David, yeah. myself, or someone else, right? Uh, but I wanted to make the point that if lake plans are gonna be more restrictive, there's a chance the Lake Plan Association or Lake Association will have to defend that at a hearing if it's challenged. And I think that was the point I was really trying to make. Uh, supplemental, um, Madam Chair. <laughs> I like the idea, and I've said this from the first, that if we're going to do lake plans, there's got to be some way of the township saying it's not just a collection of people that are very vociferous and are, are well organized and uh, are, are pushing uh, for their own agenda. So there's got to be uh, on the lake plans that we put in place that the township has done its due diligence to confirm that the, 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 the spokes group for the lake is in fact representative of the greater majority of the stakeholders on that lake. Uh, so I like that, and I think I, 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 um, I think we need to do that. Whether the, the the official plan can put that in there or not, I think the also the the township needs to uh, um, to look at the items that are requested by um, the lake lake associations and say that they are somewhat or, or, or are supportive or not supportive of the items that are listed. So everyone has a clear understanding. Okay, so before you get to your next topic, Councillor Roberts, I think we have a number of people who want to speak to this. So uh, Councillor Jaglowitz. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I now am confused, and maybe I'd like clarification from staff or the consultant. I assume that when a lake plan got ins inserted in the TML's official plan, that it was part of TML's policy for that lake. Uh, I'm now hearing that that may not be so. So maybe... Um, maybe you can be clarified because if it's going to be part of our policy, then we need to look at the uh, conditions and make sure we can support them. But if it's merely being inserted and not part of our policy, then I agree. I have to agree with uh, Councillor Roberts that maybe uh, 
maybe this hasn't been well thought out. So I just like clarification. I, I don't know why if, if there's a, if a lake plan is part of our official plan and it's being challenged, I don't know why the township wouldn't look at it like any other part of its official plan being challenged. Mr. McDonald? Yeah, and, and you know, that, that, that's a fair comment. And I, I, up until now, our approach has been to accept the lake plans as is and include them within the township's official plan. And we've accepted them. Um, and I guess what we need to do is basically look at each of them and, and ensure that we are in full support of them so that they can be defended. And if there is a component that cannot be in my opinion, another planner may have another opinion, right? So I mean, that's what it comes down to at the end of the day. So all I was raising was that there is that potential for a lake plan to come forward. And if the township's position is to incorporate them into the official plan, there may be elements in some circumstances that cannot be supported by the township, but the township will incorporate it because that's what the township wants to do to recognize the value of, of these lake plans. So again, the OLT is all about the giving of evidence and the rendering of opinions. It's, it's not about how something was done and who did it. It will come down to a person's professional uh, planning opinion. Um, I don't know if that helps you uh, <laughs> with that question. Um, I guess I'm doing the best I can to basically say, you know, there may be a circumstance where this will be, be a problem. Um, I don't think we have one now, but there may be a circumstance in the future where that becomes a problem. So before I get to Mayor Harding, I can think of the RCC, where if our official policy is just a tool and these lake plans have a hard cap through the RCC, that is, and that gets challenged at OLT, which is probably a very likely scenario, then what does the township do? Do we basically say we were in agreement that they get to make their own tighter rules on, on these small lakes? I just throw that out as a concrete example, Mr. McDonald. Um, I'm going to go to Mayor Hart. I, I, I didn't mean an answer. I just thought I'd throw that in uh, for now anyway. Mayor Hart. Uh, thank you. It, it raises an interesting point as to how we go forward, because at the end of the day, any dispute with OLT will come back to a planning justification report and why we should or shouldn't do it. And if a policy was put in place without a justification based on professional planning evidence, I, I would agree with Mr. McDonald, we may not win and or the lake wouldn't win or they wouldn't, I know Mr. Pink certainly want, wouldn't want to be putting his name to that. I, I like trying to support the lakes or the creation of lake plans. I guess the question is, do we need to have a lake plan submitted and then have our planning staff write a document saying, these are the areas we would agree with with this, these are the areas you would be on your own so that they would understand um, our professional planners uh, who would be supporting this or I guess, or defending this uh, at an OLT in that. So, and I'd, I'd really love to have on some of those, you know, again, Mr. Pink, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Diamond's comment as to here's the lake plan, great in its, in its totality. If it's challenged, we are certainly behind you on all these things. These things you might be on your own because we don't have our own planning support. I don't know if that's a path forward or not, but it's certainly uh, a little bit more work going forward, but at least we could issue an official uh, statement on each lake plan. Okay, Mr. Pink. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a suggestion, I believe um, those staff reports, uh, we did bring forward staff reports. Um, I can't uh, recall specifically off the top of my head, but I think I did include appendices that outline certain uh, policies that would differ from uh, current or proposed policies. I think what you're suggesting and what can be done, I think we're all more or less saying the same thing. Perhaps uh, Mr. McDonald, Mr. Diamond and myself can reach out to the various lake associations and have those discussions with them as to uh, which policies uh, we may um, uh, as we've talked about, have some concerns uh, with if they happen to be appealed uh, and have those discussions with those various uh, lake associations. Okay, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you very much. I've had a little bit of a problem with the uh, internet coming in and out, but I'll, uh, and that 
As far as lake plans, I think they're a, a good idea. They should be included in it. You know, we, again, going back to our strategic plan is the environment. A lot of these lake plans are trying to save the environment. So if we can't support them, then we should change our uh, strategic plan and say we're not in favor of, of the environment at this point. Whether it's the lake plans or the aggregates or anything else like that, the environment should be coming first if that is our, our, our goal. If not, we should maybe uh, change it. Thank you. Okay, so I am not seeing uh, any other comments. So perhaps Mr. Pink on your suggestion that you could reach out to the lake plans and explain what can be supported and can't be supported. So there's complete transparency. That would be great. I don't know, Councillor, uh, Councillor Roberts, I know you had more, but you may want to still comment on this. Go ahead. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. And I think this has been good discussion, but I, I really think that our, our, our township needs to uh, validate the, the, that the, the lake plan that has been offered up is representative of the majority of people on the lake and uh, what the formula of that would be. Okay, I think that might be a discussion for another day, actually. Okay. Um, and it may be that we, we present the lakes with the formula that they need to produce so that, it's, so that we can ensure that that's happened. So, okay, and I think you had, did you not have uh, aggregates on your agenda there? Yes, I did, thank you very much. Okay, so I'd like to start off by, by, by saying to Mr. McDonald that, you know, this has been a long process and you have done a, a, a really good job in stick handling through all the, the, the pitfalls and stuff like this uh, and getting us to the point that we are today. And we do have a, little, a, a much more of the journey to go. But I think in the area of, of aggregates, um, I, I, you know, and I've expressed this from day one, I, 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 I have not really um, supported the position that was written um, by Meridian. And, and so with that, but thank you and sincerely, uh, you, you, you and Jim have done a good job to get us through to this point, as well as our, as our, our, our staff in the township. But can, committee may recall that on June the 16th, that um, uh, on June 16th, 2017, the official plan amendment for number 46 and zoning bylaw amendment 13 slash 12 was proposed to establish a class A category one pit and a category two quarry within two kilometers of the of a water uh, front uh, a waterfront designation uh, known as uh, Lambert's Lake and M Mud Lake and that was defeated. Um, you know, then the committee's 27, uh, 2017 decision was appealed to the Ontario Municipal Board by the applicants. On June 14th, 2019, Council defeated a subsequent motion to reconsider the 2017 motion. Um, and they defeated it and sent it back. Unfortunately, um, Meridian's uh, aggregate memorandums section did not mention this history, which I felt which should have been is very important and should have been included. Meridian's L6 aggregate section did not provide a summary of the reasons why Council numerous constituents, the Friends of Muskoka, MLA, Small Lake Associations, and other stakeholders so were supportive of the proposed restriction, continue to be supportive of the proposed restrictions, including um, the two kilometer buffer for urban centers and waterfront designation. It implies that the, 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 uh, that the, the, the bold assumption that that only the only reason the two kilometer restriction was because of the proposed Lipa pit quarry. And this is wrong because uh, we, it includes urban centers and there's many lakes as demonstrated about, about, uh, as of, of the comments that we received from the public and interest groups. Speculation that the two kilometer um, restriction is unknown and attempts in no way to suggest, and, and the Meridian report attempts in no way to suggest why the restriction is in place. For what I'm saying for supportive justification right now or most recently is that you should be referencing the, 20, the 2021 Township of Muskoka's strategic plan. Talks about the environment, 
talks about tranquility. It talks about character. It doesn't. The the memorandum, uh, the, the report provided memorandum does not provide any option for um, opinion for for a committee why setting a two kilometer section is not appropriate. They just said it wasn't appropriate, and I'm left with the impression that every group that uh, every group will seek a variance. So why continue to support this restriction? The the, the, the report states that the very well um, states that well-known understanding that any applicant has the ability to submit an application to amend the official plan. Any applicant has the ability to submit an application to amend the official plan and provide appropriate justification for proposal. That every applicant ha application has to be considered on its own merits. Well, this is a well-known uh, well planning guidelines and applies to everything being uh, discussed today and should not just be specifically highlighted under aggregates. And then perhaps highlighting LIPA appeal should not have been included in the memorandum since the Township of Muskoka Lakes Council has clearly stated their position on this matter. And it, 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 I don't think it was appropriate to have it in there. Um, I do believe it was very appropriate for, for, for the consultant to bring the aggregate um, uh, uh, discussion forward in, in, in the appendix, but I suggest given that the aggregate opinions and guidelines provided and have provided continue to not support the township's uh, restrictive policies that the consultant reconsider if, it, if, if the, the, the consultant is the appropriate agent to provide guidance and opinion to the township on this specific matter. I don't need a reply to that. It's just a statement I needed to make. I was getting um, a lot of calls from the, from the constituents, so this is just not my opinion. Thank you. All right. Um, any, uh, Councillor Jagowitz? Yes, Chair, it's not on this subject. Is, is, are you finished with this subject? I believe we are. Okay. So please go ahead. Okay. My, uh, my issue had to do with next steps. I, I really thank everyone for the progress we've made, but what I'd like, I would like staff to come forward with a roadmap of how we're going to get this uh, official plan approved by this council before the end of our term. I understand it will not be approved by the district at the end, uh, likely, but I'd like to see us move as, as, well, as, as, as um, well as we can to ensuring that we have a plan that we're comfortable with and we have endorsed. And I'd like to do it before the end of council. And the reason for that is that, as you know, after an, after an election, things, things can change. And I think there's been a lot of hard work and I'd hate to see it um, go to waste. So I'd appreciate if staff would prepare that or at least tell us what we have to do to, to, to make that happen. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask Mr. Pink to answer that, but I, I will tell you that we've managed in one day to to get the uh, get this on to be redrafted. So I think it's a good first step, uh, Councilor Jaglowitz, um, Director Pink. Thank you. Uh, staff has included um, infographics or, or timelines of the process in the work program, and we're happy to provide those details uh, when this matter returns, so we can. Uh, more clearly uh, lay out the remaining steps, but very briefly, I think we had an excellent meeting. We provided a number of recommendations to the consulting team and staff. I've spoken with Mr. McDonald and Mr. Diamond. I believe we can produce uh, the next draft likely within a month uh, to two months. And uh, to directly answer your question, I guess it is somewhat largely in council's hands at that point. We will have a number of meetings scheduled that would likely be uh, late May, uh, sort of early mid June, and if things go smoothly and that uh, those policies as, as prepared and the next draft of the official plan found acceptable, uh, we can schedule uh, a public meeting. Uh, we're likely looking at June or July, uh, and at that stage, once we have our statutory open house and statutory public meeting, uh, council's technically in a position at that point to uh, consider adoption. Now, obviously, the, uh, the unknown or the million dollar question is the feedback from the community, the public input we get at that public meeting. 
Um, and of course, we will need some time to digest that and consider further revisions. That's part of the work plan. Um, but we could, uh, staff still intending to proceed with, uh, uh, with a public meeting, hopefully uh, earlier this summer. And then at that stage, I think uh, our recommendation at this point will likely be to somewhat play by ear, depending on the dates of the election and the amount of feedback we get uh, and the, and the uh, type of feedback we get from the community uh, through the public meeting process. But we can uh, work as diligently as possible to try to conclude uh, this project in this term of council. I would certainly not want to see the good work uh, that we've undertaken the last uh, three, I believe approximately three years go to any type of waste. Um, so uh, we will continue to move uh, one step at a time forward. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you very much, Chair uh, Bridgman. Uh, further to uh, uh, Councillor Roberts, we have been hearing for years loud and clear that the people want two kilometers from, from any water source and near the highway. I would like to see that included and go out to the public because if we do anything but, we're, we're gonna, we will get pushed back from the public and that they've been after this for years and that, and I'm sure there can be a planning reason for it. I've talked to different aggregate uh, people. There's about a 25 year supply with the existing pits right now. So we don't need any new, new, new pits near within two kilometers of water. And, that, and that's like I say, from the constituents that I've talked to that we've heard. So why beat around the bush? It's going to come in, and that's what we're going to want. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mayor Harding. Uh, thank you. Just a point of clarification. I believe actually in the official plan in the new draft, it does say two kilometers. There's a caveat with it, but so I think we are going down that two kilometer road, and uh, I support that at the same time. As to Councillor Jaglett's questions, let me also just say I, I appreciate where staff have come. Uh, where consultants uh, have come to get us to this point in the official plan. Um, the process will unfold. I, I, I do not believe we need to rush and jam anything through. I, I stake my name and reputation on the work that this committee and council has done to pave the road for a new official plan. And um, if we've got it right, whoever comes in come October, would realize that we have it right because of the public input. And uh, that's what I believe that we've spent enough time doing our homework, creating justification, and we're gonna get more justification as this next draft comes to us and we get public input to make sure we get to the right answer. And I've sat around this table and I know that others have sat here. 2014-14 um, uh, didn't come in until 16 or 17 that new bylaw and it was started and was intended originally to come in as a zoning bylaw in 1414. So uh, as much as we always want things, I, I hope we can, but let the process dictate the process because I believe in the work that our consultants and our staff have done to get us to new official plan uh, that will last for the next 20 years, so to speak, even though this has been around maybe 10 years. Uh, let's see how long it lasts anyway. Thank you, Mayor Harding. I was just going to say, look, we're going to take the process uh, as it unfolds. And hopefully we can get this done this term. We're not going to push and we're not going to stall because we're here for four years to do what we can do. So, so Councillor Jagowitz, we'll see what happens when it all comes back, I think is the answer, actually. Councillor Mazan. Uh, thank you. And through you, I was putting my hand up and down. I'm I don't want to repeat anything, and this is uh, coming to a nice close, it feels like. Um, in the final comments of the report, we talk about the different stakeholder groups, and there's lots of excellent suggestions, and I was trying to listen to some of the comments earlier today, and just as, as we go through that next process, I'm assuming that the documents that the MLA, the MRA, our Muskoka, <laughs> that have uh, forwarded things on are all going to be captured. Like, I think there were a few things that I heard a few delegates speak of to earlier today that they thought were missed in the language. And I'm just assuming that that's part of this uh, next step in the next draft. Is that correct? 
Uh, through you, Chair Bridgman, if, if you don't mind, uh, I should have mentioned that in my presentation that there were many uh, excellent comments made by the watershed folks, the district, uh, the uh, and, and the ratepayer groups uh, that we will be looking at um, and and incorporating in the next draft. So yes, for sure, those are not lost. Many excellent suggestions were made. And just as a quick supplemental, you did note um, the watershed council. Uh, had some excellent suggestions. I'm not sure as council if we've received that. And if we have, I apologize. I've been trying to read everything that I've received, but if we haven't, if we could receive those comments, that would be helpful. And I, again, if we have, I apologize to the Watershed Council. I have been looking and I can't seem to find them in my, um, in my inbox. Um, uh, Mr. Pink. Thank you, uh, Chair. What staff can do, I can send an email to all of Council with all the written submissions that we've received since the uh, open houses uh, last fall and forward it to uh, all of Council just so you have them for your files and review. But as Mr. McDonald noted, uh, they have been received. We are reviewing them and we will uh, consider them as we consider as we prepare the next draft. But I can certainly make them available to all of Council. Send those out shortly. Okay, all right, uh, any other comments? All right, I'm going to read this motion then. Uh, moved by Councillor Hayes, seconded by Councillor Edwards. Be it resolved that staff be directed to provide a second draft official plan for committee's consideration based on the recommended directions contained in Appendix 3 of Report Plan-2022-60. Any comments? All in favor? Madam Chair, or Madam Clerk. <laughs> oh, yeah, too many meetings too close together, guys. Anyway, um, so that's terrific. So we are now going to um, depart. And Mr. McDonald, and I know Mr. Diamond isn't here, but thank you very much again. It's been a very productive meeting. And always, Director Pink, to you and, and staff, we look forward to the next, uh, to the next uh, official draft and seeing you back here whenever that works. And I see Councillor Edwards may have a comment too, but thank you. Councillor Edwards? Oh, oh, you have the magic hand now. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I wonder if that's going to survive through till next term. What, what happens if you vote <laughs> and you leave your hand up too long, your, your other hand comes up to give you rest. <laughs> so I do not have any, any questions. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Then I am going to um, read the read for the adjournment of this. And obviously we don't need Friday's meeting, which we're all going, yay. Okay. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Kelly, seconded by Councillor Mazan. Be it resolved that special planning committee meeting adjourn at 2.27 p.m. And the next regular planning committee meeting be held on Thursday, April 18th, 2022 at 9 a.m. Electronically from the council chambers, municipal offices, in Port Carlene, Ontario. Do I have to say that this has been the second, stopped? The, do you have a, so, you have a second? It does, but do I have to say it if we're not having the meeting? Yeah, you have to say it that it's canceled. That's why, that's why I had two of these copies. Okay, hang on. And this next meeting is actually April 14th. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, Okay, April 14th. Uh, further, be it resolved that the special planning committee meeting scheduled for Friday, March 25th, uh, 2022 at 9 a.m. be canceled as it is no longer necessary. Any comments? All in favor? Thank you, everyone. I hope you can get outside and enjoy some of the beautiful sunshine here. Thanks for all your work. Okay.